All right, how's everybody doing? Hotel. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. It is Monday, December 3rd, 2018. Monday, December 3rd, 2018. And uh, we're here broadcasting on Facebook, our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. All right, so everybody share this broadcast um, on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in also. So I wanted to talk about this topic and give an update on this story. Uh, I did a broadcast on um, my YouTube channel, uh, I think around uh, about November 21st, uh, dealing with this, November 20th, November 21st, dealing with Black China going to Nigeria to promote a skin lightening cream called Whitenicious, okay? And I, I was blocked on Facebook at the time, so didn't broadcast on Facebook. But I want to do this broadcast here to cover that topic and give an update, okay? So she was going to, uh, she was traveling to Nigeria. She was going to be there on November 25th, okay, to uh, promote a skin lightening cream called White Tenicious, but many people are calling calling it a skin bleaching cream, okay? And the uh, White Tenicious skin lightening cream, that was launched in 2014 by a Cameroonian Nigerian singer named uh, uh, Densia. And I talked about this back when this story broke back uh, in 2014. So I've been covering this story for four years, all right? So how's everybody doing today? Everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page and invite your friends to tune in also. I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Okay, some of you all saw uh, the African History Network show we did uh, Sunday night. We broadcast it here on Facebook Live uh, in the studios, studios at 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF in uh, Southfield, Michigan. Okay, so here's what happened, all right? Um, TMZ had a story about this that a lot of people picked up and face-to-faceafrica.com had a really good story. This get, deals with uh, skin bleach and this deals with um, white supremacy being a global system. And it deals with how uh, African countries like Nigeria and South Africa and things like this have a real problem with skin bleaching products that can lead to high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, different types of cancers, things like this. It can cause a lot of horrific problems. So face to face Africa uh, dot com, uh, face the number two face Africa dot com. They had an article from uh, November 20th, 2018, Black China is heading to Nigeria to roll out new skin bleaching cream. Black China is heading to Nigeria to roll out new skin bleaching cream, okay? And uh, like I said, she was she was going to be there in Lagos, Nigeria, November 25th. Uh, so here's what happened. Uh, American model entrepreneur, socialite, and former stripper, Black China, is going to Nigeria on her first ever Africa trip to roll out a new skin bleaching. They call it skin bleaching cream, but it's promoted as a skin lightening cream produced in partnership with White Tanishas by Densia. White Tanishas by Densia, a luxury skincare line owned by a controversial Cameroonian singer named Densia. Okay. And I'm going to show you some pictures here because it's important for us to understand this, you know, and this deals with the power of media and uh, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. Uh, so this deals with the uh, power of media and this deals with um, stand, uh, standards uh, of um, uh, European standards of beauty being enforced. Uh, being forced upon us, okay? And this, these standards going all around the world, and uh, this deals with uh, many uh, African people and African Americans acquiescing to this, okay? And replicating uh, these European standards of beauty. All right, so I want to pull up this article here also from, um, yeah, from Verastic. So I want you to see Densia as well, okay? All right, so we'll go to that in just a minute. Have to let let that load up. Okay, so 
Uh, now, Black China, uh, whose real name is Angela Renee White, uh, was scheduled to be in Lagos, Nigeria on November 25th, and she went there. There was an altercation while she was there. There was some type of shoving match with another woman. Uh, for the official, she, she was going to uh, Lagos, Nigeria, for the official launch of the White Initiatives by Black China Diamond, Ill Diamond Illuminating and Lightning Cream together with Densia at a shopping event and uh, Black China announced this on her uh, Instagram page. Now, because of the backlash, okay, because of what happened, uh, because of the backlash of her even going there to promote this skin lightening cream, uh, Black China removed the post from her Instagram page, okay? And uh, we, we have the post, so I may be able to show it to you uh, also. But let me show you um, I want to show you didn't see it, okay? And this has um, this has a lot to do with colonialism, a holdover from slavery, all different types of things like this. All right. So let's look at this here. Okay. So here's Black China with the with the uh, black hair, and um, here is now. See, here was the post that was here. On her, on her Instagram page, but it was removed. She removed it. Now here's Black China with the blonde hair, which is a whole nother problem because some of us have more blonde hair than white women and white people. Uh, now this is Densia, okay? Now, this is before and after. Now Densia is the one who launched this white tenacious uh, skin lightening cream back in 2014. She's a Cameroonian and Nigerian pop singer, okay? She's half Cameroonian, half Nigerian. This is her, uh, uh, as she normally looked, brown skin, beautiful sister. Know that she had black hair. This is before using white tenacious, okay? Then you see her, the other picture, kind of looks like Casper the Friendly Ghost, and you see her after using white tenacious, and you see her with the blondish hair. Now, Densia has said repeatedly that white tenacious is not a skin bleaching cream, it's a skin lightening cream to lighten uh, dark spots. And we, we know because of hyperpigmentation, we know African Americans, African people have uh, different dark spots and different spots that are darker than the rest of the face and they want to even the skin tone. That's understandable, right? But what happened to the rest of what happened to the rest of her body? Was her whole body a dark spot? Was was then see her whole body a dark spot? Because back in 2014, when this story broke, I went to her, I went to her um Twitter page, and that's where these pictures come from. I went to her Twitter page and I saw before pictures and after pictures. Okay. So uh and then here's one also from um and let's see, let's uh flip over. See if this will show up. Uh, this is another one. And uh, I think I may have to show you this one. This is another one from uh, promoting the uh, white tenacious. So this is Densia once again, promoting white tenacious. It's promoted as a seven-day fast-acting dark spot removal. It's promoted as a seven-day fast-acting dark spot removal, okay? And I've been studying this since 2014 when the story broke. I did. I talked about this on my radio show back then. This is an article from January 9th, 2014 from Verastic.com. Can we talk about Densia's white tenacious dark spot remover? OK. And uh, she said even back then, hey, it's not a skin bleaching cream. It's uh, to remove dark spots. All right. But uh, that's not how a lot of people are using it. OK. And uh, we're going to, uh, I'll share some comments uh, from her also with you as well. But this is a serious problem. And what's, what's happening is, is that uh, African Americans, like Black China, are taking this mentality to the motherland, to Africa, and promoting this nonsense to our brothers and sisters in, uh, in Africa. All right. So let's continue with the article from um, Face-to-Face uh, -face Africa. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your Facebook page. We'll come to uh, we'll come to your comments, okay? It's important people understand. See, this is why the African History Network is so important. We have to counter 
this attack on us. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you hate yourself, because we've been stripped of African history and culture, which gives us our foundation, it gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, right? And that, uh, that is taken away from us, our language, our history, our spiritual systems, our names, and then European culture, European religion, uh, uh, norms, standards of beauty are superimposed upon us. And we're taught to see reality through the eyes of Europeans, okay? And this is what's detrimental to us. All right. Okay, and then also we want to let you know, um, visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. We have a, a current promotion, spend $100 or more, get 20% off your entire order. Use promo code ahn 20 off 2018 So you can use it on our DVD lectures, online courses that I teach everything, okay? africanhistorynetwork.com. All right, and that's uh, running for one more day. Okay, so if we go back to the article from um, face-to-faceafrica.com, uh, let's see here. Okay, so um, Black China, whose real name is Angela Renee White, um, was scheduled to be in Lagos, Nigeria, November 25th for the official launch of the White Initiatives by Black and a Diamond Diamond Illuminating and Lightning Cream, together with Densia at a shopping event. Uh, and she announced this on her Instagram page. She has 14 million followers also on Instagram. Who, I mean, uh, okay. Now, her, her representatives told American media, Black China's represent, representatives told American media that, quote, she has been using White Tanisha's dark spot corrector for a few years to deal with her hyperpigmentation, to deal with her hyperpigmentation. And uh, quote unquote, and the new product is for people of color who suffer from skin issues, according to TMZ. A fancy jar of this white initiatives by Black Diamond sells for 250 American dollars, all right? Now, what happened was, uh, after this article came out, after so TMZ was like the one that really broke this story, okay? But then TMZ uh, had a follow-up story on uh, November 23rd, and this dealing with, it's called Black China Promotion of Skin Lightning Cream. It's a white lie. So what we find out in this article here is that Black China doesn't even use the white tenacious skin, uh, skin lightning cream. Black China's touting of a skin lightning beauty product is just a cash grab because she allegedly doesn't even use the stuff. Sources close to uh, Black China tell TMZ, despite her partnership with White Tanishas by Densia to roll out her White Tanishas by Black China Diamond Illuminating and Lightning Cream, she's never applied it to her own skin, which contradicts what we were told earlier, we were told, okay, she's been using it for a few years, according to the, 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 the uh, article from TMZ, the original article said that uh, uh, she had been using, uh, one of her representatives told TMZ she had been using the skin bleaching cream for a few years, come to find out that's not true. So this is just all about the money. And now she looks like she used the skin bleach, Black China looks like she used the skin bleaching cream because here, I want to show you this picture also. This is in the article from TMZ. Let's uh, let's share this again, okay? Okay, so on the right you see the you see the darker, the little darker complexion from March of 2016 of Black China. But then on the left you see the Black China that's in the ads promoting her going to Nigeria and promoting white initiatives, white initiatives. One, you see it with the blonde hair, which is really problematic. I'm not trying to attack any African-American women wearing blonde hair, but you have to ask yourself the question, why? Because, see, because we've been taught to see reality through the eyes of Europeans and we've been bombarded with hundreds of thousands of images and magazines and TV and movies and, and music videos, things like this, of a standard of beauty, we hear things like gentlemen prefer blonde. Blondes have more fun. 
And even though there's a theory, even though you have the stereotype of the dumb blonde, usually, usually the dumb blonde is attractive, right? And has men coming after her. So when you look at these two pictures side by side, you see in the in the in the picture on the right, you see her with a little darker skin complexion with black hair. And then you see her promoting white initials with a lighter skin complexion and blonde hair. And we have to ask ourselves this question. See, what whatever's disseminated becomes imitated. We have to ask ourselves this question: why? Okay. And as we understand that white supremacy is a global system, and as we understand how when Europeans were coming out of the dark ages, and as they're conquering people's lands, and Christopher Columbus and others are going out and conquering people's lands and, and using the wealth that they, that they find to rebuild Europe, we have a rise in the European phenotype, and we have a reinterpretation of uh, previous images that were historically African images. So we have a reinterpretation of the black Madonna and child reinterpreted as a white Mary and Jesus. We have Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel and using his relatives, his white relatives as the models for Adam and Eve. And he, he depicts God as being white and things like this. So as we have a rise in European powers in the um, uh, going into the late 1400s, uh, early 1500s, et cetera, going into the 1600s, as we have a rise in the European powers, we have a rise in the European phenotype, okay? And you have uh, the, uh, historically African mythological heroes like Hercules get reinterpreted as white. Okay, so, so we have to understand this history, understand how this works so we know how to fight against this, okay? And the foundation is reclaiming African history and culture, which gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. Okay, let's continue here. So come to find out, after all of this, come to find out Black China doesn't even use white conditions, and it seems like this is just a money grab, okay? Sources close to Black China tell TMZ, despite her partnership with white conditions by Dencia, uh, she's never applied it to her own skin. Now, we're told uh, Black China uh, was presented with a business opportunity and offered good money to promote the, the cream which goes for $250 uh, per, uh, per Swarovski uh, crystals studded jar. So, uh, so she said, yes, simple as that. Well, it's not as simple as that because we have to understand what are we doing to our brothers and sisters in Africa when we go there to promote this nonsense to them. Now, it's interesting because while China's reps tell us she's been using Watanisha's dark spot corrector products for a few years to deal with her hyperpigmentation, they didn't say she used the lightning cream. Once again, it's interesting because while China's reps tell us she's been using Watanisha's dark spot corrector products for a few years to deal with her hyperpigmentation, they didn't say she used the lightning cream. But still, it was implied. Now, this isn't the first time Black China has been accused of misleading marketing. Last year, she was criticized for pushing another controversial item, a detox tea, a detox tea, T-E-A, for a flat tummy amid rumors she had plastic surgery to appear more fit. Okay, either way, Black China is cashing checks from these companies while she's currently getting uh, zilch from Rob Kardashian. It's a whole nother that's a whole nother uh, train wreck conversation there, all right? I don't get into a bunch of that reality TV nonsense. Um, I'm gonna go back to the article from Face-to-Face uh, -face Africa. All right, so a Cameroonian entrepreneur and singer, Reprudencia Sonke, Reprudencia Sonke, better known as Densia or Densia. Testing one, two, three. Okay, sounds better. All right, I don't know what happened. Maybe in a fluctuation in the speed of the internet. Because I had to I had to go to Comcast and swap out a modem. This happened like last month, I think it was. And I, I, had, I spent like four and a half hours with Comcast because I was having problems. So I had to go and swap out my modem. Once I got the new modem, things started working much better. Okay, 
So Cameroonian entrepreneur and singer Reprudencia Sonke, properly known as Densia, has come under attack for her skin bleaching cream, White Tenicious, since its launch in 2014. Okay, her luxury skin, uh, her luxury skincare products have been described as an abomination that teaches young girls to be ashamed of their skin. All right. Now, the U.S. based artist has insisted on several platforms that her cream is only for covering blemishes and hyperpigmentation, but not to shame dark skinned women. This is what Densia has been saying since 2014. But when you look at her before and after pictures, you come away with a different impression. All right. She said, quote, some people, they don't feel confident. They don't feel pure. They don't feel clean with dark spots. I said, I, I said seven day fast acting dark spot remover. It's called reading comprehension. If people miss that class, then it's not my fault. If they think their whole body is a dark spot, then fine, because that's not how I feel, end quote, Densia said in a television interview. Okay, so once again, I just want you to see Densia uh, because this is before, the, here she is brown skin, before she, st she started using white tenacious. And here she is on the right after she used white tenacious. It appears she used it on her entire body. It appears she didn't just use it for hyperpigmentation or dark spots, unless she thought her entire body was a dark spot. She used it on her thighs, her ankles, her feet, her wrist, her arms, her stomach, her chest. Okay. All right, so I'm not trying to beat up on the sister, but we we have to fight this because this comes from a self-hatred that's being promoted, reinforced by white supremacy and racism. All right, so skin bleaching is a major problem. Now, okay, so uh, Densia herself has gone through several phases of skin lightening, and she looks uh, light-skinned as compared to her previous skin, as I just showed you. Now, skin bleaching is a major problem in Africa and diaspora communities like Honduras, Panama, Haiti, uh, things like this, uh, diaspora communities around the world. Many women and men go through the risk of lightening their skins to be rewarded as desirable and beautiful. Many women and men go through the risk of lightening their skins to be regarded as desirable and beautiful. Now, many skin lightening creams include mercury, cortisone, uh, hydroquinine, chemi uh, uh, chemicals that are linked to skin cancer, high blood pressure, thinning of the skin, other forms of cancer, kidney and liver failure. Kidney and liver failure. But many of them want to appear lighter skin and look white so much so. And they think that this is going to give them more job opportunities. They see this associated with power because it's reinforced by the images that they see. Whatever's disseminated becomes imitated. So they're willing, they're, they are willing to risk skin cancer and other forms of cancer, kidney and liver failure, things like this for this appearance. And it reminds me in the movie Malcolm X when Malcolm got his first conk. And after he let them put this lie on his head and Damn near burned his scalp, and he's sitting there in the chair going crazy and doing great pain to straighten his hair. He looks in the mirror and he says, It looks real white, don't it? Now, the risks associated with skin bleaching inspired Minnesota public health advocate Amira Ad uh, Adawe, uh, who has made it her personal mission to seek out shops selling skin bleaching creams and report their activities. Okay, now she is a, a, a Somali-born um, anti-skin bleaching crusader, and she is the manager for the Children's Cabinet of Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton and host of a weekly radio show called Beauty Wellness Talk, Beauty Wellness Talk. She discusses the issues that prompt women to alter their skin 
including colorism, self-esteem, social media, and self-hate. Colorism, self-esteem, social media, and self-hate. Now in Africa, skin bleaching products have been outlawed in countries such as Ghana, Togo, South Africa, Mali, etc. But the laws uh, are not being implemented. So they have the laws in the books, but for whatever reason, they're not being implemented. Maybe they don't have the man and woman power to go and actually enforce the laws. Now there is still a high demand for skin bleaching products, which have now been rebranded, rebranded as toning products or dark spot correction and lightning creams, okay? It's the, it's the same thing. These are skin bleaching creams, however. White Tanishas is marketed as a dark spot remover, okay, or, a, or possibly a lightning cream, but not as a skin bleaching cream, but it all does the same thing. Now, there's a, there's a link in this article from, from uh, face-to-faceafrica.com there's a link to a previous article that they wrote dealing with this dealing with this issue uh, on the continent of Africa, uh, and this it, this is from May second, two thousand eighteen, and this is called "Skin Bleaching Isn't Passe in Africa; It's Just Being Rebranded." Skin bleaching is not passe in Africa; it has just been rebranded. All right, and. Uh, they have a documentary in here, a little short, it's about 26-minute documentary, called Beauty and the Bleach. Beauty and the Bleach. Now, it's put out by Russia Today, Russia Today Africa, I think it is, okay, which is funded by the, the state of, you know, the government of Russia. But they have some good information in here as well. Beauty and the Bleach. Senegalese women risk permanent skin damage for the sake of lighter skin. I wanna uh, show you this picture here. I'm not gonna show the video, but show you this picture. Now this is dealing with Senegal, Beauty and the Bleach. So when you read this article, you have to watch this uh, short documentary, the short video they have in here. Senegalese women risk permanent skin damage for sake of lighter skin, okay? And uh, check out this article here. This is uh, skin bleaching isn't passe in Africa. It's just been rebranded. Okay, that's the name of the article for May 2nd, 2018. Skin bleaching isn't passe in Africa. It's just been rebranded. And then they show like uh, this product here, Ivory Caps Skin Enhancement Formula, triple strength, 100% natural. They show you before and after, okay? All right. So when we look at this article here, uh, it talks about, it, it says, uh, despite skin bleaching products being outlawed in countries uh, such as Ghana, Togo, South Africa, Mali, the demand for lightning has rather increased. It is estimated that 70% of Nigerian women and 52% um, and 67% of Senegalese women, I think they left one country out, um, use skin lightening agents, okay? The conundrum lies in the products that are used to formulate uh, skin bleaching creams and the likes. Many include mercury, cortisone, hydroquinone, chemicals linked to skin cancer, et cetera. The World Health, the World Health Organization, the WHO, the World Health Organization has specifically banned these chemicals due to their danger uh, to individuals' health. Despite the dangers, the practice is still going strong. As Jackson Marcel said, quote, black people are seen as dangerous. Black people are seen as dangerous. That's why I don't like being black. People treat me better now because I look like I'm white. See this, see, so we have to understand racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race that comes out of the ideology of white supremacy. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, reasons, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, jobs, health care, media, etc. And they use this to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. 
And this is for the purpose of preserving genetic white. That's what this is about. And so the, the so racism is the power structure. It's a system. It comes out of the ide ideology of white supremacy. So this is why you have to understand history, especially late 1400s, mid to late 1400s, early 1500s, to really understand this. When you look at the when you look at the documentary that they have here, Beauty and the Bleach, they take you through Senegal and they're driving down the street and you see all these billboards, right? These uh, advertisements for beauty products, things like this. And one of the things they talk about how is that the models in many of these ads, if not if not the majority of them, but really the majority of these ads, the models in the majority of these ads are lighter skin models. So they're constantly being bombarded with these images in ads, showing them lighter skin being more desirable, lighter skin being more attractive. And you have a lot of you have a lot of women who are trying to lighten their skin so they can get jobs as models, so they can have more opportunity. So Jackson Marcel said black people are seen as dangerous. That's why I don't like being black. People treat me better now because I look I'm white. Okay, quote unquote. Now, skin bleaching has evolved to toning, dark spot correction, and lightening. Pregnant women in Ghana. Now, this is this is what's so sad. And I've seen stories about this. The whole thing is sad, but this is even worse. Pregnant women in Ghana have even taken to injecting pills that will lighten the skin of their unborn children. This is how deep the self hatred is. And Ghana, go to Ghana. Those are brothers and sisters. But you see, this this is the, the this is the the holdover. These are the results of colonialism, right? And you go to Ghana, you see more images of a white Jesus in Ghana than you will see in a lot of uh, black than than you would see in a lot of African American communities in this country. You see images of white Jesus all over Ghana. This, they were colonized by the British, okay? And, 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 and they colonized our minds. Now, the effects of uh, pregnant women using these pills to lighten the skin complexion of their unborn children, uh, these, uh, these pills can damage the limbs and internal organs of these children and cause additional birth defects as well, okay? So then there are advocates dedicated to assuring women with dark skin that they are beautiful. Amira uh, Adawe, uh, Adawe is one of them, a Somali uh, American who hosts um, a, a radio show, has gotten uh, women calling in to discuss the societal and cultural pressures that lead them to alter their skin tone, okay? And uh, Amira said of skin lightening, quote, a lot of it ties to colonization. A lot of it ties to colonization. Certain skin colors were more accepted in the society. But through the years, it became so embedded in the culture to where it's become normal. Through the years, it became so embedded into the culture that it became become normal. If you're light skinned, you're more acceptable. Okay, so th this is what we're dealing with. Long held notions about what suitable color is are still proving to have a stronghold on the mentality of blacks and other ethnic groups. It runs deeper than just beauty and appearance. Okay, so this is why at reclaiming African history and culture is so important, okay? This is why African-American controlled media is so important so we can put forth images of ourselves being ourselves, okay? And all, all different skin tones of African people are beautiful, but we should not be trying to bleach our skin to look white, all right? And this is one of the reasons why the film Black Panther was so, was so powerful and so popular. Uh, one, all the women you saw in the film, the women from Wakanda, they had natural hairstyles or they were bald. Two, you saw a lot of beautiful dark-skinned women, powerful dark-skinned women. 
uh, represented in the film as well. We're, we're talking about uh, Lupita Nyong'o's character, Nakia, uh, brown-skinned women like Angela Bassett, uh, Danae Guerrera, General Okoya, uh, things like this. You have uh, Letitia Wright, who is uh, plays Shuri, uh, T'Challa's half-sister, who is a genius, and she's an engineer, and she's the one that's making all these uh, technological devices, right, that we see in uh, Wakanda. Okay. So, um, so Black China went there. We found out, she, we found out she does not use white initials. We found out this was a money grab. Okay. Now, um, speaking of Lapita Nyong'o, there was a, uh, article that I wrote back, um, in 2014, so Lupita Nyong'o was named People Magazine's most beautiful person, right? And I wrote this article May oh 2016, May 9th 2016, but uh, she was she was named uh, Thursday, April 23rd 2014. She was named People Magazine's most beautiful person. And this was there was a story on ABC World News Tonight with Diane Sawyer. Everybody needs to go check this out, okay? You can Google this. And Deborah Roberts, who's African-American, beautiful, dark-skinned sister, um, she was she did a story dealing with a black dial, white dial test, okay? And they uh, also dealt with actress Lapita Nyong'o, okay, who we first saw in 12 Years a Slave. We see her in, in Black Panther, all right? But... Uh, Deborah Roberts reporting for ABC did a story about colorism and the effects of the media on our children, the effect of the media on our children. Now, Lapita Nyong'o uh, said that, so Lapita Nyong'o was speaking at an Essence Magazine luncheon or something like that. I forgot exactly what it was, but it was for Essence Magazine. And she said when she was a child, uh, she, now she's from Kenya. OK, she said when she was a child growing up in Africa, she had one wish. She said uh, that at night before she went to bed, she would say her prayers and she would pray to God that he would make her lighter skinned. OK, now, many people have argued with me claiming that the media has no effect on our children. And there is no problem with our women dyeing their hair blonde, straightening their hair, et cetera. Don't beat me up. I'm just dealing with the research. I'm just with the understanding history. Now, in the video of the broadcast, and you can just search ABC World News tonight, April 23rd, 2014, Lapita Nyong'o, something like that. They did a black dial, white dial test, with, uh, and it was administered by Dr. Deidre Royster, PhD, a white, white female who's a sociologist at New York University. And they did a study with a group of young girls of different ethnic groups and female uh, and female dogs, okay? So they had African-American, Hispanic, Asian girls, okay? They were, um, I think they were like seven, eight years old, something like that, or five to eight years old, something like that. And when you watch this, what happens is the girls continued to choose the white dial the, dot, the white dial with the blonde hair as the pretty dial. So they're asked different questions, which dial is the, the nice dial, which dial is the pretty dial, things like this. They, con they continue to choose, the majority of them continue to choose the white dial with the blonde hair as the pretty dial. So when Deborah Roberts asked sociologist Dr. Deidre Royster, right? So what does this mean? Dr. Deidre Royster, a white female, responded, quote, blonder, lighter, more European features are still seen as most desirable. Blonder, lighter, more European features are still seen as the most desirable, end quote. So I asked the question, what happens to our children when they put a higher value on European features than their own features? What happens when they put a higher value on a European texture of hair than their own natural textures of hair? What are we telling them 
and why are some of our parents uh, ill-equipped or uh, ignorant, not dumb, but ignorant, not knowing how to protect them from this as well. As Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and Nilly Fuller correctly taught us, if you do not understand European white supremacy and racism, what it is and how it works, everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you, okay? So then we see um, Lil' Kim. And we saw that uh, Little Kim posted, I think this was back in about 2016, Lil' Kim posted on her Instagram page pictures of her, uh, the new Lil' Kim, which don't look anything like the older, dark, uh, brown-skinned Lil' Kim, who was a beautiful sister. Today, I mean, she looks, um, it, oh, I'll let you see, because it doesn't look, doesn't look real. Okay, but Lil' Kim has some real self-esteem issues that she's dealing with. Okay. All right, so I'm going to try to share this here. This is running slow. Okay. Let's look at this here. This is an article from uh, news1.com. All right. So this is Lil' Kim back in 1999 with Diddy and Junior Mafia, brown skin Lil' Kim. Okay. I think this is probably after her breast implant. Because there's a uh, there's an article from newsweek.com from the year 2000 that everybody needs to read about Lil' Kim. Uh, it's an interview with Lil' Kim. And when, and when you see this interview, then you understand what's going on with her. She's in like real pain. She's hurting. She's dealing with self-esteem issues. She's dealing with issues coming from white supremacy. This is Lil' Kim in 2016 after it appears skin bleaching. You see it with the blonde hair, things like this. She's unrecognizable now. Okay. But this is uh this is serious. All right, so there was an article from um news1.com. There was a good segment from News One. Lil' Kim selfies dredge up colorism debate. Little Lil' Kim's selfies dredge up colorism debate. Dr. Yaba Blay believes the extremes Lil Lil' Kim has gone through to alter her appearance is a reflection of the society we live in. Okay, this is a really, really good segment from News One uh, dot com. And let's see. Uh, Dr. Yaba Blaze said, quote, I was sad when I saw the image of little little Kim on Sunday because that's not the Kim that so many of us look to. Uh, she thinks she's always represented a kind of in your face, unapologetic self-love for us. And she's carried us through some kind of sexual liberation, end quote. But when you actually read the interview with Lil' Kim for Newsweek.com, it talks about how, Lil' Kim talks about how when she was younger, her boyfriends would cheat on her with women who had more European features. Straighter hair, blonde hair, things like this, look white. So she said when she got some money, basically she was saying when she got some money, she wanted to emulate that more. So when she got some money, she got breast implants. Um, and she she wanted to emulate those features and those looks more because she was losing her boyfriends to men who had more European-like features. Okay, so now if we go back to the story from ABC World News tonight, um Deborah Roberts talked about how TV may be partly to blame when we little girls choosing the white blonde hair dial over African-American dials. 76% of the faces that we see on TV, specifically primetime television, are white and just 16% are black. Oh, was back in uh, 2014 when this story came out which might explain the girl's response when asked who would they prefer to look like. So when, when these little girls were asked which dial would they prefer to look like, most of them chose the white dial with the blonde hair. And um, when they were asked which dial did they want to take home with them, there was a tug of war 
between these little girls of different ethnicities, there was a tug of war with them over this white doll with the blonde hair. Now, we have to understand that African-American boys are subjected to these images also. So what happens when they grow up to be men and they're fighting over a white woman with blonde hair? Just like these little girls were fighting over a white doll with the blonde hair. So in November 3rd, 2000, in a November 3rd, 2014 interview with Glamour Magazine, Lapita La Nyong'o was asked, so this is long before Black, this was two, two years Black Panther came up. She was asked, you received of attention for your looks. Did you grow up feeling beautiful? Lapita Nyong'o, Lapita Nyong'o responded, quote, European standards of beauty are something that plagued the entire world. The idea that darker skin is not beautiful that light skin is the key to success and love. Africa is no exception. Africa is no exception. When I was in second grade, one of my teachers said, where are you going to find a husband? How are you going to find someone darker than you? She said, I was mortified. She's in second grade. She's living, I think at the time, she's living in Kenya. Here you have a teacher subjecting this African child to this type of torment that, that attacks her self-esteem. Okay, so check this out. And uh, I may have to upload this article again. I was trying to find it. But the name of this article that I wrote is called Lapita Nyong'o Explains Why She Prayed to God to Make Her Light Skin. Why She Prayed to God to Make Her Light Skin. And, and Google that because it'll come videos uh, of this also. Okay. All right. How's everybody doing? Okay, let's go to some of your comments. And then also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Hey, if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting our show, uh, pay the bills, etc. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Marcy said, uh, look at Hallmark Christmas movies every year. They have white characters with white saviors. Yep. Uh, Ruel said, news media, yes, society, uh, period. So this is why exposing our children to African-American history and culture is so important. Um, there's studies that show the positive impact that our children studying uh, African history and culture has on them academically, how it positively impacts their self-esteem. Uh, Harvard University and uh, University of Pittsburgh did, did a joint study, and they found that when uh, parents engage in different types of racial socialization, whether it's taking their children to African American uh, African American museums, taking to Kwanzaa celebrations, African American History uh, Month celebrations. It uh, reinforces a uh, positive self-esteem. It helps them to uh, do better academically in school. It also helps them to uh, better handle discrimination, things like this, okay? I'll bring up some information on that. Uh, we'll come to some more of your comments here. Okay, so we just posted a link here for the, um, we have the uh, Black Panther 10 online course uh, and uh, six DVD bundle pack. So you get 10 of the online courses that I teach. They're all on demand, watch at your own pace. Uh, and then you get six of uh, six of my DVD lectures, including three dealing with the film Black Panther. That's on sale now, $80. It's a $180 value. That's on sale now, $80 at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We just posted the link. Um, and then also, if you just want the online, if you just want the 10 course online bundle pack, you can do that as well. That's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It includes ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, which is one of the original names for Egypt, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. The Ma'afa is a key Swahili term, or Swahili, but it's actually key Swahili which means the great disaster, that's our Holocaust that deals with the transatlantic slave trade. 
And um, I, so this is a 14 hour, seven session online course dealing with understanding the transatlantic slave trade with the end teacher in school. We deal with thousands of years of history. And um, there's also some other classes in there as well. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. Um, African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and elections have consequences. So that 10 course online bundle pack by itself is $60, regularly $130. If you want it with the uh, six DVDs, uh, the Black Panther six DVD bundle pack, then it's on sale now $80, okay, for a very limited time only. And okay, so let's go back to some more of your comments here. And I'm going to bring up this PowerPoint presentation also. All right. And these make great positive gifts as well. Oh, also the other thing, if, if you want if, if you want to buy the online courses as a gift and like enroll somebody else in the in it, um, email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We can make that happen. You can just go ahead and buy it for yourself and just email me. Let, let me know who you want. It for send me their email address and I'll go ahead and enroll them uh, in the in, I'll, I'll just go ahead and enroll them in the courses then I'll email them and tell them uh, what to do I'll email them their password and they can just log in so you can buy the online courses as a gift uh, for people also they make great Kwanzaa gifts some people still celebrate Christmas I understand that as well okay let me bring this up let's go to some more of your uh, comments and then uh, also. Um, I need to, I want to tell you about um, this concept I came up with that I'm really promoting called Economic Empowerment Sundays at churches, Economic Empowerment Sundays at churches, okay? I'm going to talk about that in just a minute because this deals with recycling about $1 billion in a year throughout uh, 35,000 churches. All right, let's look at some more of your comments. Uh, Fatima said, media and self-hatred have a huge influence, especially when Black parents aren't reinforcing self-esteem and Black empowerment. So this is why we have to get this information to our people, to our families. If you look at the uh, uh, one of my most recent presentations I did uh, a few days ago, dealing with the Texas, the, the, the Texas School Board has announced that they're changing the way the history of slavery is being taught. Uh, in all the schools in the state of Texas, and there, and this, and school children are going to be taught correctly that slavery was the central reason why the Civil War was fought. Slavery was the central cause of the civil of the U.S. Civil War. And uh, in the presentation that I did, and you can watch it here on uh, Facebook and YouTube, they referenced this study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And this study, everybody needs to download this. Okay. This is downloaded. I took it to the printer, got it printed up. But this is called Teaching American, Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Okay. And this deals with documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in many of our schools, how certain things like slavery enactments that some of our children are told to participate in in school, how this can psychologically damage them. And then it talks about how to correctly and more correctly teach the history of slavery, okay? So that is a very, very important document. So when we go to these school board meetings, when we go to, uh, uh, and we're trying to get changes implemented in our schools, we have to go in with the facts and evidence. We have to go in with the studies. See, a lot of times we'll go on with feelings and emotions and not deal and not deal with facts and evidence, okay? And this is, uh, this is a problem. So this type, you can get the DVD lectures, you can get the online courses for your children also, and this will have a transformational effect on your children and families as well. Okay, let's go to some more of your comments here. Um, Ruel, Ruel said, our children are now in a different generation, so yes, we do. I agree, Robert. Okay, she's talking to Robert. I'm not sure what exactly was said. Um, Pamela Todd said, real sad. Fatima said, sad, real. Uh, let's see here. What did Robert say? Robert, like another listener said, we need to teach our Black children our history and how beautiful we are as a people. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So every home, every American home should have a education center because we'll have entertainment centers in our homes. We'll have flat screen TVs. We'll have PlayStations, Xboxes. We'll have the Wii's, Nintendo Wii's. We'll have the Roku systems, Blu-ray DVD players. Um, we'll have the surround sound stereo system, right? So we'll have an entertainment center. But where's your education center? You know, where's your University of San Jose in the city of Timbuktu in your own home, okay? How many dictionaries do you have? How many, you know, uh, do you have a thesaurus? Do you have a globe, an almanac, any books, okay? We, we need to have these in our uh, homes as well for ourselves and for our children because um, children who have parents who read and, they, and, and children who see their parents reading um, books, reading uh, maybe not news, maybe maybe not physical newspapers, possibly still physical newspapers, but reading news online, they're going to grow up to be, they'll grow up to do the same thing. Okay, so let's look at this here. All right. All right, so let me show you this here. Um, let's bring this up. So these are some of the things also we deal with in the online courses that I teach and, and, and the, especially the online courses. And this is designed to counteract uh, a lot of the, a lot of this nonsense that we are uh, dealing with and experiencing. So let me share this and show this uh, to you. This should come up here. All right. And these are some of the things that we cover in the online courses that I teach, especially, especially uh, specifically ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so when we talk about that online, that when we talk about that study that I talked about teaching American history, uh, teaching hard history, American slavery, very important, right? So this was an article from the Atlantic.com from February 1st, 2018, the first day of African American History Month. What kids are really learning about slavery? What kids are really learning about slavery? A new report finds that the topic is mistaught and often sentimentalized, and students are, are alarmingly misinformed as a result, okay? Now, this statue here, we see Abraham Lincoln and a uh, formerly an enslaved African person. This is called the Lincoln Emancipation Statue. It was paid for by former enslaved people and erected in Washington, D.C. in 1876. And this statue has been criticized for representing the history of slavery from a paternalistic perspective, okay? All right, so just very quickly here, this, this, um, the, this study teaching hard history of American slavery, what they did was, was they did a online survey of 1,000 high school seniors, 1,000 12th graders across the country, and then over 1,700 uh, social studies uh, teachers across the country as well. And um, the, 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 the report finds that slavery is mistaught, mischaracterized, sanitized, and sentimentalized, leaving students poorly educated and contemporary issues of race and racism misunderstood, all right? So very quickly, what they found is that only 8% of 12th graders identified slavery as the cause of the Civil War. Only 8% of 12th graders knew that slavery was the reason why the Civil War was fought, okay? Now, yes, it is true that the, so the Civil War was fought to bring this, uh, the, the Southern states that seceded from the Union to bring them back into the Union. But they seceded from the Union to maintain slavery. Slavery was essential to their way of life. And if you read the article from um, the, uh, the Atlantic.com, uh, why there was a civil war, why there was a civil war, uh, this breaks it down, okay? And it deals with also the statements of secession from uh, some of the states that seceded from the Union, okay? And they talk about how slavery was essential to their way of life and how they were finding to uh, maintain uh, 
uh, their way of life. Okay, so this is an article from theatlantic.com entitled Why There Was a Civil War. All right, and that is from, um, I think, 2000, May 1st, 2017. And if we just look at this briefly, some of the statements of secession, um, if, an excerpt from the article says, because the Civil War was fought over slavery, because the Civil War was fought over slavery, uh, quote, our, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest of the world, end quote. Now, this is what Mississippi declared in their statement of secession. Now, we just saw the senatorial runoff election between Cindy Hyde Smith and um, between Cindy Hyde Smith and Mike Espy. And this brought up a lot of the history of Mississippi. Mississippi was one of those former Confederate states. Mississippi, right now, they still have the Confederate battle flag as part of their of their state flag. All right. We know Mississippi is where uh, Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney were killed June 21st, 1964, the three civil rights workers in Philadelphia, Mississippi, August 28, 1955. It was Emmett Till who was uh, killed in Mississippi. He was lynched. OK, that was in Money, Mississippi. We know in Jackson, Mississippi, June 12, 1963, Mega Evers, civil rights uh, worker, civil rights activist, was shot and killed by, by Byron Della Beckwith, who was a member of the White Citizens Council. We know in 1954 in Mississippi, the White Citizens Council was founded as a direct backlash to the Brown versus Board of Education desegregation case, okay? And we know that Mississippi is going to have a number of these uh, segregation academies that, that are going to be private institutions. Many of them pop up after Brown versus Board of Education, tuition-based, and these were set up to as a way to resegregate, as a way to keep the schools segregated, because now they're private institutions. You have to pay tuition, but they're going to give vouchers to white families who can't afford to go to the school to lock African Americans out. Okay, and Cindy Hyde Smith attended. Uh, Senator Cindy Hyde Smith of Mississippi attended a segregation academy, but her daughter also attended one and graduated from one in 2017. So. Leading up to the Tuesday, November 27th runoff election, all this history came out. She made her comments about attending a public hanging, things like this. So then the, the, the history came out, and NAACP has it on the national website, NAACP.org. They have a, a page dealing with the history of lynchings in this country. From 1882 to 1968, there were 4,743 lynchings that took place in this country. Well, Mississippi had the highest number. It was 581 that took place in Mississippi. Mississippi had the one eighth of those lynchings took place in Mississippi. So the, the, then you have her up here joking about attending the public hanging and they said it was a, a exaggerated expression of regard. Okay, so this is this is an example. See, to understand how things are today and why things are the way they do today and to understand how to change it, we have to understand a history of historical events that brought us to this place. And the people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community, okay? All right, so Shalanda said, please post this information about teaching our kids. Okay, so the, so the name of the study is Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. OK, you can get that from uh, SPLcenter.org or just you can just Google it, Google it. Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. OK, I'll post a link uh, at the end. Uh, but it's also at SPLcenter.org, Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLcenter.org. OK, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. Hello from North Carolina. OK, Mom Wood. And see, in North Carolina, you all have some serious voter suppression going on in North Carolina. Uh, as well. And all, all, all this, when we, when we study what took place when the 15th Amendment was ratified, okay, the attacks on Africans trying to suppress the vote, and then what takes place after Reconstruction ends in 1877, all of this deals with understanding the predicament we're in today and how to put policies in place, how to put plans in place to fight, to fight it. 
but you can't understand which direction to go and what needs to take place till you understand the history of how you got to this, how you got to this predicament. Okay, so Louisiana in their statement of secession said the people of the slave holding states are bound together by the same necessity and determination to preserve African slavery. Okay. And um, uh, the servitude of the African race as existing in these states is mutually beneficial to both bond and free and is abundantly authorized and justified by the experience of mankind and the revealed will of the almighty creator as recognized by all Christian nations. This is what Texas said in their statement of secession. Okay, so we have to understand this history. Read the, read the article, Why There Was a Civil War from the Atlantic.com, May 1st, 2017. And you're going to have um, these, these states secede from the Union starting with South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, six weeks after Abraham Lincoln becomes the uh, president-elect, and they fear that Lincoln is going to free, uh, free the enslaved Africans, and their wealth was tied to their slaves. So they're seceding from the Union. They elect Jefferson Davis as the uh, president of the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America, and Jefferson Davis was a, a U.S. senator from where? The state of Mississippi where Cindy Hyde Smith is, who's one of the biggest traders in the history of this country. Okay, Jefferson Davis. And then when you go to Georgia and you look at Stone Mountain in Georgia, right? Stone Mountain is a huge mountain, but on the side of Stone Mountain, there's, the car there's a carving of three Confederate heroes. Who are they? General Robert E. Lee, PGT Beauregard, and Jefferson Davis. That's there right now in Georgia, where Stacey Abrams was running for governor. That's there right now. Okay. Rail said, I just found out I'm in the fourth racism state. Wow. What, what do you mean, Rail? Okay, let's, get, let's continue here. All right. So only 8% of 12th graders identify slavery as the cause of the Civil War. Fewer than one third, 32% correctly named the 13th Amendment as the formal end of uh, U.S. slavery, with a slightly higher share, 35 percent, choosing the Emancipation Proclamation, that the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the enslaved Africans, and fewer than half, 46 percent, identified the Middle Passage as the transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to North America, okay? Um, and then when they talk about some of the problems with the way slavery is being taught in schools across the country. Now, these are not just African-American schools. These are schools across the country that they're discussing. Uh, one, we teach about slavery without context, preferring to present the good news before the bad. And what I do when I deal with the history of the transatlantic slave trade, we deal with things chronologically as much as possible, especially in the online courses that I teach. And we deal with ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. We deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we deal with how this leads to the transatlantic slave trade happening. So we deal with history before we were conquered by Europeans shackled in chains and dehumanized. Two, we tend to subscribe to a progressive view of American history that can acknowledge flaws only to the extent that they have been addressed and solved. So what it's saying is that we, we don't deal with the flaws in American history or American society that really still exists today. We only deal with the flaws that we feel have been addressed. So we may talk about civil rights, but we will talk about like, we won't talk about why civil rights need to be needed to take place, why it was a direct violation of the U.S. Constitution, why Jim Crow laws were enacted when they contradict the U.S. Constitution. Okay. All right. Uh, three, we teach about the American enslavement of Africans as an exclusively Southern institution. When when you study the 13 colonies, all the 13 colonies had, had slaves, okay? Not only that, also what's not talked about is the fact that the, um, the, the Spanish were enslaving Africans about 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia, August 20, 1619. They were enslaving Africans in the, uh, they were taking Africans into the territory that we today call South Carolina. 
in the 1520s. This is 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia. And one of the biggest problems with the way that the history of slavery is taught is that um, we're told that we first came to this land as enslaved Africans, which is not true. This was our land stolen from us. We we have been here in this land at least 51,700 years. And this is uh, information that Dr. David M. Hotep talks about in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. It's a groundbreaking book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And he deals with this type of information here in his book. This is one of the sources for our online course as well, okay? Um, and, and he has a new book coming out, The First Americans with Africans Revisit. He's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him a number of times. So when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and click on podcast on the homepage, you can listen to uh, interviews I've done with him. Uh, he and I did a double lecture back in 2013. He's dealing with the First Americans with Africans documented evidence. And I'm dealing with great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, some other topics. And that is part of a new bundle pack we have, an eight DVD bundle pack called The Africans That Were Here Before Columbus, The Africans That Were Here Before Columbus. So we know that uh, October 12th was uh, Columbus Day. And some people still celebrate it, not sure why. But uh, this eight DVD bundle pack uh, deals with uh, the African presence in this country before Europeans came here. And even though Columbus never came to the land we call the United States of America, he did come to the Western Hemisphere. The closest he came here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. So you get the double lecture I did with Dr. David M. Hotel. You get the double lecture I did with Professor the Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman, who you see in the Hidden Colors documentaries. He's dealing with the African presence in Mexico and the Mississippi Valley, things like this. And um, uh, you also get uh, the lecture that Dr. Ivan Van Sertema did dealing with They Came Before Columbus, uh, Christopher Columbus and African Holocaust lecture from, from Dr. John Henry Clark and some other ones as well. So that's an eight DVD bundle pack. The Africans that were here before Columbus, that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. That's on sale $70. Uh, remember, with our current promotion, spend $100 or more, get 20% off your entire order. That's running one more day. Um, that's uh, promo code 8HN20 off 2018. But we have it at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, so let's continue here. How's everybody doing? We'll come to some more of your comments here. Uh, okay. All right. So we teach about the American enslavement of Africans as an exclusively Southern institution, which is problematic. Uh, four, we rarely connect slavery to the ideology that grew up to sustain and protect the white supremacy. So when I deal with the transatlantic slave trade, because of the way, the, because of the, the type of information that I study, um, and some Professor Kaba Kamenei taught me, he said, you know, you can either deal with it chronologically or episodically. And it's incorrect to deal with it episodically. This is something that Dr. Leonard Jeffries taught me also. We have to deal with the transatlantic slave trade chronologically and deal with how a sequence of historical events have a domino effect and lead up to other events taking place. Uh, number five, we often rely on pedagogy poorly suited to the topic. Uh, when, when we ask teachers to tell us about their favorite lesson when teaching about slavery, dozens probably reported classroom simulations, which, are, which are not good. Simulation of traumatic experiences is not shown to be effective as a learning strategy and can harm vulnerable children. When you have African American children, and you are reenacting a slave auction and you have them standing like slaves being sold off and separated from families. No, I don't know why people thought that would be a good idea. No. Number six, we rarely connect slavery to the ideology that grew up to sustain and protect the white supremacy. I think I had that twice. Um, seven, we tend to center on the white experience when we teach about slavery it's recommended to read slave narratives. So a lot of times when they teach about slavery, they teach about it through the eyes of Europeans, right? <laughs> but not from the perspective of the enslaved African. This is why slave narratives have to be read. So you get a firsthand account also. Okay, now 
when we look at studies that deal with the impact that studying our history and culture has on our children, because there's studies that document this, right? Uh, the root.com had an article, new studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. Okay, new studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. And this is why what um, Black China was doing in Nigeria was so detrimental because that same mentality is projected to African-Americans here, especially African-American girls. Now, believing that black is beautiful, an important mantra of self-acceptance and self-love could pay major dividends in school a new study find. So um, this is uh, part two of the broadcast I was doing earlier, and we ran into some technical difficulties toward the end. So this is part two. And uh, this is dealing with uh, Black China, reality TV star uh, uh, Black China, who went to Nigeria uh, Sunday, November 25th, to promote the uh, skin whitening cream, White Tenacious, and to promote it to Nigerians, okay? So I, I was talking about this, this is very disturbing. Um, Skin bleaching, skin lightening products are an epidemic in some African countries like Ghana and South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Togo, things of this nature. And in many of these countries, they have been banned. But these uh, skin lightening uh, products, et cetera, have been um, rebranded as skin toning or spot removers, et cetera. OK, so uh, I wanted to just recap some of what I was talking about and uh, then continue because I was showing you some slides from a PowerPoint presentation also. Okay, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Uh, invite your friends to tune in also. How's everybody doing? Okay, so this is uh, something very disturbing. And what we found out, you know, I did a, a initial broadcast about this uh, back on, uh, I think the 21st or 22nd of November, and I did it on YouTube. Well, uh, TMZ was the first one to break this story, and then they had a follow-up story uh, where it was revealed that Black China, contrary to earlier reports, Black China does not use this skin bleaching cream, this skin lightening cream, White Tenacious, okay? So a little background information on White Tenacious. White Tenacious was launched in um, 2014, okay, and it's from a Cameroonian, a Nigerian a singer named Densia, Densia, okay? And I'll show you a picture here of uh, Densia. And uh, she obviously has been using uh, this product that she promotes, okay? Now, she takes offense to you calling it a skin bleaching cream. She says it's a spot remover. But if we look at her on the left, the, the before picture, she was a beautiful sister. This is what she looked like before she started lightening her skin. And this is an after picture. Notice the before picture, brown skin, black hair. The after picture, okay, she is uh, almost white and blonde hair. All right. So it, uh, it's marketed, uh, uh, White Tenacious by Densia is marketed as a seven-day spot remover. OK, a seven day, you know, dark spot remover. But people are using it for uh, skin bleaching purposes. And she knows this. OK. And she has talked about this in the past. All right. So just very, very quickly here. And you, you see this. Uh, now, this is a picture here of. Um, we'll let this load. This is a picture here of Black China. And just a second here. All right, I'll let that load up. I'll show you a picture of Black China as well. All right, so uh, Densia said some people, they don't, they don't feel confident, they don't feel pure, they don't feel clean with dark spots. I said seven day fast acting dark spot remover. It's called reading comprehension. If people miss that class, uh, that is not my fault. If they think, uh, if they think that their whole body is a dark spot, then fine. 
because that's not how I feel. Uh, and she said this during the television interview. Now, Densia herself has gone through several phases of skin lightening, and she looks like she looks light skinned as compared to her previous dark skin. So this was a good article from Face to Face Africa dot com, Face to Face Africa dot com, from uh, November twenty first, entitled November twentieth, two thousand eighteen, entitled Black China is heading to Nigeria to roll out new skin bleaching cream. So she will Lagos, Nigeria, uh, Sunday, November twenty fifth, to promote. Um, version of the skin lightening cream that is 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 called white tenacious by black china diamond illuminating and lightning cream okay and she was going to lego lagos nigeria she was going to meet up with densia and they were uh at a shopping mall or something like this promoting um uh, this new line of the skin lightening cream all right so come to find out uh White China does not use this skin lightening cream either, okay? So this is, it appears just a, a money play. She's doing this to make money. And according to TMZ, a jar, a fancy jar of this skin lightening cream goes for $250. Now, Black China's representatives told American media that, quote, she has been using White Tanisha's dark spot corrector for a few years to deal with her hyperpigmentation and the new product uh, is for people of color who suffer from skin issues. But then later, it was reported by TMZ uh, in the article entitled Black China Promotion of Skin Lightning Cream. It's a white lie from November 23rd, 2018. Uh, it, 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 it talks about how sources close to uh, Black China tell TMZ, despite her partnership with White Tanisha's by Densia, to roll out her white, quote, white tenacious by Black China diamond illuminating and lightning cream, end quote, she's never applied it to her own skin. She's never applied it to her own skin, okay? And here is a uh, picture of uh, Black China. This is uh, the one on the right with a little darker skin tone is from 2016, March 2016. The one on the left is from uh, an ad promoting her, her white tenacious by Black China skin lightning cream. And you see her with the blonde hair and the lighter hue skinned holding this white cream. The other picture, her skin is, is a more of a browner tone and she has black hair. OK, so I was dealing with uh, how the these images that use a European standard of beauty, how they negatively impact us, okay? And also there's another uh, article to check out from face-to-faceafrica.com. There's a link in the uh, first article dealing with Black China's heading to Nigeria uh, to uh, roll out new skin bleaching cream. There's a link to an article uh, at this one uh, when, it, when it talks about skin bleaching creams being rebranded. It says in Africa, skin bleaching products have been outlawed in, in countries such as Ghana, Togo, South Africa, Mali, et cetera, but the laws are not being implemented. There is still a high demand for skin bleaching products, which have now been rebranded as toning, dark spot correction, and lightning creams, okay? Toning, dark spot correction, and lightning creams. There's a, a link to uh, another article uh, entitled Skin Bleaching Isn't Passe in Africa, It's Just Been Rebranded. Skin Bleaching is not Passe in Africa, It's Just Been Rebranded, okay? And uh, in this article, they have a, a short little documentary, a video entitled Beauty and the Bleach, Beauty and the Bleach. Senegalese women risk permanent skin damage for sake of lighter shade. So you have to watch this also because I went through and watched it. And this is devastating. This is taking place on the continent of Africa right now. As I explained to people, white supremacy is a global system. White supremacy is a global system. And as Dr. Francis Cress Wilson and Nilly Fuller correctly taught us, if you do not understand European white supremacy and racism, what it is and how it works, Everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you. So even, even though they are in Africa and even though they have 
they speak African languages, they have more of their culture intact than we have here. They're being bombarded with images of European standards of beauty. Okay, so you have to watch this one. Beauty and the Bleach Senegalese women Senegalese women risk permanent skin damage for sake of lighter shade. And when they uh, in in that video, they show you they take you down a street in a town in Senegal and they show you the different billboards promoting beauty products. It's like this. And the models in these on these billboards, in these ads, most of the models are lighter skin. So what this is doing on a daily basis in Senegal is reinforcing lighter skin being more desirable, attractive, being associated with having a better job, a better position, a better career, et cetera. So you have African women in Senegal wanting to lighten their skin to become models, right, to achieve the standard of beauty. Okay, so, uh, and then also this article talks about how pregnant women in Ghana have even taken to ingesting pills that will lighten the skin of their unborn children. And I see Ghana, see, this, this all comes from, this is the result of colonialism. And these European countries, the German, the Germans, the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, all this, these, these, the, the English, these European countries, the British, colonizing these African countries, imposing, superimposing European culture, language, uh, standards of beauty onto these African people, forcing Christianity, especially white Christianity, onto them. And these vestiges still exist today on the continent of Africa. Pregnant women in Ghana have been taken to ingesting pills that will lighten the skin of their unborn children. The effects are uh, damage to limbs of the children and internal organs and additional birth defects. Okay, so read the rest of that article as well. So when you have somebody like Black China going to Africa to promote this to our, our brothers and sisters in Africa. I mean, this is devastating. This is wrong on so many levels. This comes out of a self-hatred, okay? This comes out of a self-hatred. And to do this to our brothers and sisters for a paycheck, I mean, this is, this is ridiculous, okay? Now, how's everybody doing? Okay, Marticia, how you doing, Marticia? Uh, Lynn, uh, why is the black mind so easily colonized? Well, it wasn't easily colonized. We have to understand uh, hundreds of years of history. And, and we have to understand the enslavement process and what took place during colonialism. So it wasn't easily colonized. Okay. And uh, also we'll talk about some of the online courses that I teach as well, like understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Yeah, ben, unfortunately, this is a huge business outside of the U.S., Tracy said, Black China, uh, all about getting money. Uh, that's her thing. Couldn't continue to con Rob Kardashian's bank account. So now China's coming uh, to an entire African nation uh, for money. Okay. So in uh, National Public Radio, I want to go to this other article. Black China came to Nigeria to launch a skin lightening cream at $250 a jar. So this article, unlike a lot of the other ones, this was written after her November 25th, Sunday, November 25th visit to Lagos, Nigeria. Okay, so this is extremely important. This is from uh, National Public Radio, npr.com, um, .org, npr.org, written by uh, Meko uh, Muzenda, M-U-Z-E-N-D-A. And uh, very quickly here, uh, everybody share this broadcast on your Facebook page and uh, invite your friends to tune in. And then also... Um, uh, our current promotion at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, um, spend $100 or more, get 20% off your entire order, okay? Spend $100 or more, get 20% off your order. Use promo code AHN20OFF2018. We have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All of my DVD lectures are there and the online courses that I teach to help counter a lot of this nonsense that we see to help counter the, the self-hatred, okay? Uh, the, the foundation is African history and culture. This gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. This influences our economic empowerment 
and political empowerment, okay? And we have, um, for the holiday season and for Kwanzaa, uh, we have the um, Black Panther 10, uh, 10 online course uh, bundle pack combined with the uh, six DVD bundle pack, okay? It's a Black Panther 10 online course and DVD bundle pack. So you get 10 of my online courses, then with my history, including understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in the school. All the courses are on demand, watch at your own pace. And then you get the six DVD Black Panther bundle pack, which includes three of my lectures, then with the film Black Panther and three other lectures. So these make great gifts also. Uh, that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's on sale $80. It's a $180 value. We just posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast, but it's also right on the homepage of AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, let's continue. And African-American uh, business owners, post the name of your business here in the thread of the broadcast. We'll let you know how you can advertise uh, with us on the audio podcast of our shows also. Email us at customerservice at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Customerservice at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So African-American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. All right, so let's continue here. Okay, so when we look at this article from uh, NPR.com, NPR.org, National Public Radio, Black China came to Nigeria to launch a skin lightening cream at $250 a jar. Um, so let's see here. Um, okay, so they talk about how it's from the cosmetic uh, uh, White Tanishas. It's from the cosmetic company White Tanishas, a skincare line that has been controversial since its launch in 2014. So I've been covering White Tanishas by Densia since 2014, okay? Uh, and she is the Cameroonian Nigerian singer who launched the skin uh, lightning cream. Uh, the new cream comes in a crystal adorned jar and sells for $250 for 100 grams, about 3.5 ounces. That's a far higher price uh, than for other skin lightning products found in small pharmacies and shops along streets. Promotional material for the cream, like the image shown above, creates an image of glamour to appeal to a high-end audience, creates a an image of glamour to appeal to a high-end audience. The company says the product, quote, restores, illuminates, tightens, firms, and moisturizes the face, end quote, all right? So Black China's partnering with the Cameroonian singer Densia, who started White Tanishas. The name of the company itself has received criticism for seeming to equate whiteness with beauty equating whiteness with beauty. In an interview with Britain's Channel 4 in 2014, uh, Densia stated that the quote unquote white and white tenacious means pure, pure, okay? Now as for the high price for Black China's cream, Densia defends it calling the cream a luxury product. Uh, the, the market for skin lightening creams in Nigeria is huge. According to a 2011 report by the World Health Organization, the WHO, not the, not the rock band, the WHO, but this is the, the World Health Organization, also referred to as WHO. 77% uh, of Nigerian women use skin lightening products. As in other parts of the world, the reason is often a perceived social bias against darker skinned women, a perceived social bias against darker skinned women. Now, here you are in Black Africa. Here you are in Nigeria, okay? And there's a perceived social bias against darker skinned women in Nigeria. And our sisters are turning to skin lightening creams that have a lot of negative side effects. They can cause, uh, they have carcinogens in many of them that are cancer causing agents. Uh, they can cause cancer. They can uh, uh, cause uh, liver failure, uh, kidney disease, uh, high blood pressure, all different types of things like this. Uh, if we go back and look at the article from uh, face-to-faceafrica.com, skin bleaching isn't passe in Africa. It's just being rebranded. They talk about how uh, the conundrum lies in the conundrum lies in the products that are used to formulate skin bleaching creams and the likes. Many of these products include mercury, cortisone, and hydroquinone, chemicals li linked to skin cancer, high blood pressure, thinning of the skin, other forms of cancer, and kidney and liver failure, okay? So this, and, and we have to understand why 
African history and culture is so important. And, and even in Africa, they're fighting against the vestiges. They're fighting against the remnants of colonialism. They're fighting against self-hatred, even in Africa. Okay? So we, we, we have to understand how white supremacy is a global system, and we, and we have to fight against this. And African Americans have to denounce nonsense like this when one of our own goes over to Africa and promotes this poison to our own people. So there is, uh, so uh, there is the potential for side effects with some skin lighteners. Okay, uh, they contain mercury, steroids, and high levels of uh, hydroquinone, uh, which can lead to problems like skin thinning, blisters, and acne. Some countries, including Nigeria, have have banned the use of such ingredients in cosmetic products. White Tanisius states that none of these ingredients are in the products. Okay. So uh, Black China's visit wasn't just about promoting the cream. Coinciding with her visit, White Tanisha's opened, uh, so the, the, the company, White Tanisha's, opened its first store in Lagos, Nigeria, with Densia and Black China in attendance. So now you have a White Tanisha store that opened up in Lagos, Nigeria. Now, Black China, who was born, her, her real name is Angela Renee White, and uh, she was born in Washington, D.C., also visited an orphanage in Lagos and made a donation. I hope she didn't give them white tenacious at the orphanage. I sure hope she did. I sure hope she didn't give them white tenacious. But in news coverage and on social media, this was overshadowed by the launch of her skin cream, skin lightning cream. Amid the hoopla, conversations on skin bleaching and beauty standards sprang up in every corner. And then there was one altercation she was getting out of an SUV, and it was it looked like a woman that was pushing her, shoving her, something like that as well. So there was one altercation, uh, at least one that we know of. But the role of Black China in the product line is a very deliberate choice, says uh, Shingi uh, Mtero, who is a lecturer at Rhodes University probably named after Caesar Rhodes, Master of Genocide, who teaches a course on the politics of skin bleaching. Okay, Shingi Mtero teaches a course on the politics of skin bleaching. And uh, Shingi said, quote, African-American culture really does have a big influence on Black African culture, end quote. Now, M. Terrell also points out that there are misconceptions about why people in Africa bleach their skin. There's a difference between using products to say correct skin conditions, such as acne scarring and uneven skin tone, and products that lighten skin by several shades. That's understandable. Hyperpigmentation, things like this, you want to have an even skin tone. That's understandable. But what happens when you use that? That's what, what happens when you use that skin cream on your entire body, like Densia did? What happens when you use that on your entire body, unless you think your entire body is a dark spot? Now, um, Shingi and Tara went on to say, quote, there's an assumption that people who bleach their skin are irrational, she said. But she does not believe that is the case. Quote, black women who bleach their skin believe that it will give them access and power. Black women who bleach their skin believe that it will give them access and power. They think through their, they think through their decision, end quote. Now, in post-colonial Africa, there is still a premium on light skin, she said. Quote, whiteness is something that many Africans aspire to. And light skin still has a still has social capital. Whiteness is something that many Africans aspire to, and light skin still has social capital. End quote. Now, as long as light skin represents social capital and privilege, Shingi Mtero uh, uh, believes skin bleaching will remain popular and profitable for celebrities like Densia and Black China. But see, African Americans have to speak out again. We have to denounce this. We have to denounce this and not support those people who promote that to our, to our brothers and sisters. And this is why media is so important because whatever disseminated becomes imitated. To do for yourself what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself, okay? So this is why controlling African-American media, African media, so we can 
uh, put forth positive images of ourselves and we can operate based upon African standards of beauty as opposed to European standards of beauty. This is why this is so important. Okay, how's everybody doing? You can post your comments here. We'll come to some of your comments. We have Kathleen, we have Tracy, uh, Rosie, some of the people here. All right. Okay, so uh, check out this article also from uh, NPR.org, uh, really good article uh, as well. Black China came to Nigeria to launch a skin lightening cream at $250, $250 a jar. Okay, makes absolutely no sense. All right, so um, because in the previous broadcast, I didn't get a chance to get to that last article. All right, so and, and what I was doing was I was also dealing with uh, – I was talking some about the uh, 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 the study dealing with uh, teaching history of American slavery uh, and dealing with how the history of slavery uh, has been mistaught, is being mistaught in schools across the country and with uh, images of African-Americans in the media also and, and showing how there are studies that uh, talk about how um, the positive impact that our children uh, learning their history has on them and has on their academic performance as well. There's studies uh, that document this and how it positively impacts uh, their self-esteem as well. Okay. All right. So I'm going to pull that uh, back up uh, also. And this helps to correct um, African-Americans trying to acquiesce to European standards of beauty and straighten our hair, lighten our skin, dye our hair blonde. This is not an attack on anybody, but we have to understand what happened to us during the transatlantic slave trade. We have to, have to understand what happened to us during colonialism in Africa, okay? Um, and because we're still dealing with the remnants of all of that, and we're still dealing with this self-hatred. Okay, so let's uh, let's flip over here, and I'm going to show you a couple studies that uh, show why studying our history is so important. All right, and let's go to uh, some of your let's go to some of your comments here. This is why brown skin with locks can get interviewed for jobs. European standards, Kathleen said. And that's something that's something that we have to uh, fight against because a lot of those corporations that will discriminate against us, um, a lot of those corporations, we uh, spend dollars with them. And, and so you have some people that say, well, well, we need to own our own businesses and then we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's true. But um, most African-Americans are going to, uh, at least in the foreseeable near future, next 10, 15 years, most African-Americans are not going to be working for African-American owned businesses and they're not, and they're not going to have their own business either. Most African-Americans are going to be working for other people, most likely white people. That's just, that's just the bottom line. If you understand the numbers, 2.6 million uh, African-American owned businesses as of 2012, they're probably at least 3 million a day. Only about 100,000 have employees. They employ somewhere between 1 million to 1.5 million people. But there are 20 million African-Americans in the labor market either looking for work, either working or looking for work. So that 3 million African-American owned businesses and about 100,000 that employ 1 million to 1.5 million, that's not going to absorb half or even uh, 20 or 30 percent of the 20 million African Americans in the labor market either working or looking for work. This is why a lot of people who deal with economic empowerment and entrepreneurship, if they're not telling you how many African Americans are in the labor market working or looking for work, there's a there's a fallacy in a lot of their theories. That's the reality. Okay, so let's look at this one right here. This is a, so this is a, a study that came out. Uh, I think it was uh, December of 2017. OK, I think it was December 2017. And uh, the root.com had an article about this. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. Believing that black is beautiful, an important mantra of self-acceptance and self-love could pay major dividends in, in school, a new study finds. 
So an article in the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education and, and African Americans who are involved in, in parent organizations and you're fighting with the school board, you're trying to get uh, African Center curriculum in, incorporated in the school or you want African history taught in the history classes, things like this, go read articles and studies from the from the journal of blacks and higher education okay because when we deal with these school boards and when we deal with these superintendents and principals things like this we have to go in with facts and evidence not feelings and emotions we have to be able to document what we're talking about we have to deal with facts and evidence so an article in the journal of blacks and higher education focuses on a new study from professor sharita butler barnes at Washington University in St. Louis, which finds that young African-American women with strong racial identity are more likely to be academically engaged, curious, and persistent. More likely to be academically engaged, curious, and persistent, okay? Uh, now, the study is called Promoting Resilience Among African-American Girls, Racial Identity as a Protective Factor. So we should ask protecting from what? Racial identity protecting us from what? Now, this was published on the Child Developmental, the Child Development Journal website and found that feeling positive about being Black or African-American or African, specifically African, along with feeling supported by their schools, correlated with the girls' greater academic motivation. OK, now researchers also found that feeling good about your racial identity could act as a buffer for students in, quote, hostile or negative, end quote, academic environments. But this also translates into the real world, because when you have a better uh, uh, perception of your self-identity rooted in African history and culture, it allows you to better deal with white supremacy and racism, as opposed to trying to acquiesce to um, those European standards, right? You're operating based upon an African cultural paradigm. Researchers also found that feeling good about your racial identity could act as a buffer for students in hostile or negative academic environments. We found that feeling positive about being Black and feeling support and belonging at school may be especially important for African-American girls' classroom engagement and curiosity. Feeling connected to the school may also work together with racial identity attitudes to improve academic outcomes. So read this article from theroot.com. I'm not a big fan of a lot of articles at the root, but this was a, a good one. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. Okay. All right. So then there's another one. Now this was from 2012, 2013. Uh, there was an article from AfricanGlobe.net. Black teens with racial pride do better in school. Black teens with racial pride do better in school. So this is showing a direct correlation between studying African history and culture and the impact, the transformation that it has on our children, but it has that tra same transformation on our adults. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. Okay, so we operate within the limited, the limited circumference of our own awareness. Your thoughts create feelings. Your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. So if we want to change our results, we have to change the information that we're taking in. So African-American teenagers perform better academically when their parents instill in them a sense of racial pride. African-American teenagers perform better academically when their parents instill in them a sense of racial pride. Now, this was a joint study. Who was this joint study done by? The University of Pitt, Pittsburgh and Harvard University. The University of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and Harvard University did this joint study. And this study shows that when parents use racial socialization, such as talking to their children or engaging in activities that promote feelings of racial knowledge, studying their history. You should have your children check out the broadcast that I do here on the African History Network, okay? Watch the, the YouTube videos I do. I'm gonna do a bunch of cursing and things like that, vulgarities, things like that, okay? Read a lot of the articles that we post here as well. Uh, when parents use racial socialization, such as talking to their children or engaging in activities that promote feelings of racial knowledge, pride, and connection, it offsets racial discrimination's potential, potentially negative impact on students' academic development. 
Well, this is similar to what the study from Professor Sharita Butler Barnes uh, found as well. And so we take, so we need to take our children to the African American museums, like the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History uh, in Detroit, or other African American museums, uh, you know, in, in the cities where you live. You need to take them to the Kwanzaa festivals, the Kwanzaa celebrations, African American uh, History Month celebration, Dr. King Day celebration, Malcolm X, things like this. Okay, when when, when we immerse our children in those type of environments, it helps to give them positive self-esteem, not because of material wealth that they have, not because of material goods that they have, but it's, but it's connecting them to their history and cultures, connecting them to greatness. So this is, a, this is extremely important. African history and culture gives us our foundation, it gives us our values, our interests, and our principles. Okay, all right, but, but there's studies that document this, why this is so important. Okay, so uh, so check out that article also from AfricanGlobe.net. Uh, what will life be like for our babies if they can be European free? Kathleen asked. Uh, I was on UCLA campus and the hair froze beautiful. Those young sisters there in their own element. Kathleen said, okay, good. Hollywood glamorizes a, and promotes exactly what we're discussing, pitting dark and light-skinned people uh, against each other. Okay, uh, all right, let's continue here. So uh, some of the things, so this is Lapita Nyong'o, I talked about Lapita Nyong'o uh, being named back in 2014, uh, People Magazine's most beautiful person uh, back in uh, 2014. All right, so some of the things that we deal with in the online course that I teach, and, and we have an uh, online course dealing with the film Black Panther. That's in the 10-course online bundle pack, okay, uh, the one dealing with Black Panther. Uh, but, uh, okay, let me see. Hold on, flip this back over. Flip the share back over because you couldn't see that. All right. So... Uh, this is some information I have dealing with the film Black Panther uh, in the 10 course online bundle pack. There's an online class that I did dealing with the film Black Panther, how the film relates to African history and culture, things like this. But uh, also, if you get the uh, if you get the Black Panther 10 online course bundle and the uh, DVD bundle, you get the three DVD lectures I did dealing with the film Black Panther also. OK, so that's in there and that's on sale right now, $80. Uh, regularly uh, uh, $180. There's $180 value on sale for $80 at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. But in uh, the film, Black Panther was so powerful. Uh, one of the reasons why was uh, it was not another slave movie, number one. Uh, number two, uh, it showed us what Africa could look like if our history had not been interrupted by slavery and colonialism, okay? Because uh, Wakanda was never colonized like Ethiopia. It was never colonized. They were not conquered by Europeans. Okay, they were not enslaved. Uh, and number three, we saw uh, beautiful dark-skinned African women. And in Wakanda, they didn't have any perms. They didn't have weaves. They didn't have straight hair. Okay, they were dealing with uh, uh, traditional African hairstyles because they're operating based upon a African standard of beauty. All right. So we just posted the link again for the uh, uh, Black Panther 10, 10 online course bundle pack and DVD bundle. You get all of, all of them together in the online courses all taught by myself. I do a PowerPoint presentation. These are some of the slides from uh, uh, some of the presentations and they're all on demand. So you can watch at your own pace. OK, so uh, who do we have here? We have Kim and uh, Shan. You said you have no sound. Can you all hear me? You should be able to hear. Um, okay, refresh your screen if there's a problem with the sound. Can you all hear me? Okay, okay, Martisha, okay, you can hear me good. Yeah, you should be able to hear me. All right, good. Let's continue here. And we just posted the link there. How you all like this type of information? I was doing the broadcast, uh, the first part, but the, the, towards the end, it was uh, going in and out, 
it was acting up, so I had to do the second broadcast. But this thing dealing with Black China, the promotion of skin lightening creams, then see it, this ties directly in to African history and culture. This ties directly into the legacy of colonialism. OK, so uh, this is extremely important. And this is something that we have to fight it, have to fight. And we do this by uh, adopting African standards of beauty and reclaiming African history and culture. OK, how you all like this type of information? OK, Lucinda, Carlos. All right. And Bantu Stephen Biko, one of our great South African freedom fighters, said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So we must take our minds back. All right, so when we look at um, some of the things that we that uh, we cover in the online uh, course, uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so some of the things that we deal with are, uh, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play in the transatlantic slave trade? Because Columbus was central to the transatlantic slave trade uh, spreading, okay? He helped to lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, the exploitation of indigenous people. Um, and and uh, with his four voyages, starting August 3rd, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina Independent in Santa Maria. Now, Columbus never came to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he came was Cuba, which is 90 miles away, all right? Um, and that ties into the history of the Moors. You have to understand. So we, so when I teach it, I, I teach it chronologically as opposed to episodically. And we have to deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, which leads up to the transatlantic slave trade happening. Okay, we deal with when did Africans first come to the U.S. as uh, enslaved Africans. And what a lot of people don't know is, so in 2019, you're going to have all types of uh, commemorations taking place, commemorating August 20th, 1619, in Jamestown, Virginia, when, when we when we are told that the first Africans came to the shore. Now, even though that did happen, African people have been here going back at least 51,700 years. We don't know this. We don't know this was our land stolen from us. Right here in America, right here in the land we call the United States of America. We don't know. We, we've been here for tens of thousands of years. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade happened, but it's not enough to study the last 50, the last 500 years of history. We have to understand the last at least 50,000 years of history. So we deal with uh, when did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? Uh, we deal with that complicated history. And the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina, going back to the 1520s. This is uh, about 100 years be before Jamestown, Virginia, because the Spanish were the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. The Portuguese were the first ones. The Spanish were the second ones. The English are going to come later. Okay. They get involved, they start getting involved initially around, right around 1562 or so. Okay. Now, uh, were African people in America before the slave trade? we we'll talk about that. We deal with the 800-year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. One just came out of Algeria. I talked about this on my radio show Sunday night, the African History Network show. Dealing with stone tools found in Algeria, they date back 2.4 million years ago. Okay, and uh, this uh, this study, this archaeological discovery is showing that all of Africa was the cradle of civilization, as opposed to just Central East Africa, the Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania area, which was the earlier theory that was thought to be the cradle of civilization. The the new discoveries are showing now all of Africa was the cradle of civilization. And migration started much earlier than archaeologists, archaeologists and anthropologists believe. So we do a shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Insurance companies that took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans. That's extremely important. Um, Freemasonry, America, and the founding fathers. We deal with that also. We deal with the fake Willie Lynch letter of 1712 because Willie Lynch never historically existed. Okay. So these are some of the things we deal with. It's a 14 hour, seven session online course. That's like the main one. It's called Ancient and the Mafa, 
understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in the school. Okay, if you need me to post a link to the uh, bundle pack with the online courses, uh, let me know. I'll post it again. It's also around right my homepage of AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And the online courses are all on demand. You can watch at your own pace. So this is one of the sources that we use in the uh, class. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along. Uh, but I use them as sources, but if you want to get them for your own library, you can. So this is Dr. David M. Hotep. He wrote the book, The First Americans with Africans Documented Evidence. He's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him 11 times. He's working on his second book, The First Americans Where Africans Revisited. But his book is groundbreaking. It deals with the African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. Uh, you can visit his website, historictruth.info. And he also deals with the African presence in South America going back at least 56,000 years ago. Page 14 of his book, he deals with evidence um, uh, of an African presence dating back at least 51,700 years ago found uh, in a campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina, discovered by archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear. Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. Here's what they found. They found 13 different disciplines that document an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. This is before Native Americans came into existence. These were the Khoisan. The Khoisan, also known as the, uh, as the San or the Khoi Khoi, um, they come from Southern Africa. They're, they were the short-statured people. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. The Twa are derisively called pygmies in anthropology and archaeology, and they go all around the world and they were here in this land. They built pyramid mounds up and down the Mississippi River. Okay, but here's what they found. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174D haploid groups, uh, dealing with DNA and genetics. They found linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, uh, structures, and tools. Okay, 13 different disciplines really documenting an African presence. His book has 713 footnotes. Okay, his book is groundbreaking. And he talks about how he stands on the shoulders of Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, who wrote the book that came before Columbus. All right. And also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, because October, uh, we know October 12th um, was Columbus Day. And some people, for some strange reason, still celebrate Columbus Day. But uh, to deal with the history, uh, we have a new DVD bundle pack. It's an eight DVD bundle called the Africans that were here before Columbus, the Africans that were here before Columbus. So we have some of those shipping out tomorrow. And uh, this has the double lecture that I did with Dr. David M. Hotel. Uh, and he's dealing with the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. We did a double lecture here in Detroit and I'm dealing with uh, some history. I'm dealing with great African women in history. Uh, it includes a Lecture from Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, they came, they came before Columbus. Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, a lecture he did on Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust. He has a book by the same name. I have a lecture dealing with the, uh, some of the history of Christopher Columbus, as well as the history of Halloween, because Halloween is October 31st. Uh, and you get some other lectures in there as, as well. It's an eight DVD bundle pack called The Africans that were here before Columbus, the Africans that were here before Columbus, okay? So that's on sale right now, uh, $70 at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Remember with our current promotion, uh, spend $100 or more, get 20% off your entire order. Use that promo code ahn 20 off 2018 And we have that information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, all right? Okay, so let's continue here. Uh, all right, let's continue. If you need me to post any of this information again, let me know. All right, let's see where we leave off right here. Okay, so now this is Dr. Albert Goodyear, okay? He's a white archaeologist uh, from the University of South Carolina. Now, this was an article from November 18th, 2004, 14 years ago, from ScienceDaily.com which is a scientific website. And this deals with the African presence in North America 50,000 years ago. Um, and the article, na the name of the article, I should say, is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And here's a synopsis of what the article said. The radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains 
where artifacts were unearthed uh, last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate uh, indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, at least 50,000 years old, meaning that didn't have North America long before the last ice age. All right. Um, so Kathleen, it's 20% off orders of $100 or more. So if you wanted the, this bundle pack and you want to say the, uh, the Black Panther 10 online course bundle pack, with, that comes with the six DVDs, then you could do that, get 20% off of that. So it's not 20% off the $70, it's 20% off orders of $100 or more, okay? Uh, so <laughs> we, can't, we can't do 20% off the $70, all right? Okay, but all is at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So this is great. You can order these for churches. You can order these for study groups, things like that. You can, uh, people can place their orders together and get, 20% off also. Uh, let's see. Uh, so so see, these are some of the things that we deal with the, in this online course. So uh, we deal with the suppression of the knowledge and the fight against the Druids. Uh, this is an example of the class between the European mindset and a African mindset because the Druids are dealing with the Druids in Ireland. They're dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, right? And Druid means he who, he who knows in old Irish. And uh, the Druids were studying and dealing with what's called uh, the Gnosis. Gnosis means true knowledge. And they're dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet because the Greco Roman, uh, the, the Greek and Roman soldiers, when they go into uh, Egypt, right? They're learning from the ancients. They're learning from the uh, priests and priestesses of the Amen, uh, the 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 Amen uh, priesthood, Amen Ra priesthood, things like this. So they're learning a watered down version of the teachings, and they're taking these teachings back to Greece and Rome. But they're also they're also uh, going to uh, what we call Ireland, and you're going to have the Druids. And what the Druids were practicing conflicted with the Christian church, okay? And uh, so about uh, 432 AD, Pope Celestine I sent a uh, British slave named Patrick into Ireland to convert the uh, Druids and to convert the Irish to uh, Christianity, okay? So at this time, 432 AD, 5th century, the Catholic Church does not exist. The Catholic Church comes along in 11th century AD, okay, mid 11th century AD. At this time, it's the Eastern Orthodox Church. And um, they're going to, uh, Patrick is going to kill thousands of Druids, things like this, and force Christianity on them, force the Latin, uh, the Latin language as well. And Patrick becomes a patron saint to Ireland, and March 17th becomes his feast day. And on every March 17th, people honor Patrick with St. Patrick's Day. So in the mythology about Patrick, we were taught when we were all in school that he drove the snakes out of Ireland. But when you study the Druids, okay, the Druids, and here's the picture of a Druid right here. When you study the Druids, the Druids uh, wore a helmet that had a uraeus on it. The uraeus is a cobra, okay, which is a spiritual symbol coming out of ancient, Kem ancient Egypt. So when they say that Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland, they weren't talking about snakes that crawled on the ground. They were talking about two-legged snakes called Druids. And he was driving them out because they were looked at as being pagan. They were looked at as being heathenous. And what they were teaching conflicted with the Christian church, with the doctrine of the Christian church. So they had to go. This was about expanding Christianity and taking control of people's land and resources. This was, this, this was what this was all about. Um, so this is what people are celebrating on March 17th. I don't know why African-Americans celebrate St. Patrick's Day. They obviously haven't studied the history. 
This is what they this is what they're celebrating. This is what they're participating in. Okay. All right. And then if you look at um, if you look at this word here, frigatrisca decophobia. Frigatrisca decophobia. Okay. So frigatrisca decophobia means fear of Friday the thirteenth. Fear of Friday the thirteenth. And um that's a that's a long that's a long history there as well. Deals with the um uh, it deals with the Knights Templar that are formed in eleven eighteen AD uh during the Second Crusades. Uh but when but, but when the Knights Templar are disbanded and a, a group of them in France are captured and, and disbanded uh about thirteen oh seven AD, October thirteenth, Friday the thirteenth, October thirteenth. Right around 1307 AD. And this was said to be the day that the knowledge stopped. Okay. Uh, so because of this and other things, but definitely because of this, the number 13 was the number that was feared. There's some other reasons why also. Um, but Frigga or Freya or Freya is the prefix. Freya. Freya, Frigga, depend upon which European language you're um, taught, you're referencing. This was the wife of Odin. So when we study Scandinavian mythology and we study Thor, the god of thunder, and his father was Odin, okay? When you study the days of the week in the etymology, the origins of the days of the week, a lot of that goes back to Scandinavian mythology. So Thursday was called Thor's day. Wednesday was called Woden's day or Odin's day. Friday is named after Freya or Freya or Frigga. Okay, this all ties into history. This all ties into history. Okay, so this this is so when you look up the word Frigga Triskaidekaphobia. And you study the etymology of the word, it takes you back to the wife of Odin in Scandinavian mythology. Right. So then we have this meme that floats around on Facebook, social media uh, on St. Patrick's Day. I hope for the day I see black folks this prideful about their own history, fixing our own problems and unifying for a black agenda. OK, so they're wearing. And, and what's interesting is, right. When um, St. Patrick's Day comes around, let me see. I guess you all can't see this. Just turn the share back on. What's interesting is when St. Patrick's Day happens, right? Ask African Americans who participate in this, who dress up in green, all this stuff. Ask them, what the hell are you celebrating? Well, I'm celebrating St. Patrick's Day. Who was St. Patrick? He was a saint. Why was he made a saint? What did he do? He drove the snakes out of Ireland. Really? Well, because when, when you study history, there's absolutely no evidence the snakes were in Ireland because Ireland is a cold climate and it's not a climate conducive to snakes and Ireland is an island. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever of snakes being in, in Ireland. So what are you participating in? Because when you ask African-Americans who participate in St. Patrick's Day what they're celebrating, 99% of them can't tell you. We were just taught, we were taught when we were children to participate in this nonsense. And this goes to um, Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango's uh, books, uh, volume one and volume two, African People in World History, A Mental Genocide. African People in World History, A Mental Genocide, but Dr. Ishaka Musa Barashango, I think I have uh, one of his books here. Because volume one, I can't find. Volume two is somewhere around here. Now, I just had the damn book. Uh, Where's the book? I just had his book. Uh, I think I may have taken it to the radio station with me. Because I just had it a few days ago when I was talking about uh, some other stuff. And I don't know where I put his book. You want to download this study here. I have books all over the office here. Uh, you want to download this study here, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. We talked about this in part, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. This is from the Southern Poverty Law Center. This deals with, it documents how the history of slavery is being mistaught in our schools across the country, not just African-American schools, 
for schools period across the country. And it deals with how to correct it, how to correct the way the history of slavery is being taught. I did a broadcast a few days ago dealing with how um, in um, Texas, in Texas, the school board in Texas is changing the way the history of slavery is being taught. And they're going to correctly teach that slavery was the central reason why the Civil War was fought, which is correct. Okay, slavery was the central reason why the Civil War was fought. Okay, how's everybody doing? We got Dennis, Sherry. Uh, they probably already knew about the lightning skin cream, but chose not to use it. Okay, unlike American Blacks, Africans are smart people. They didn't allow their children to use sugar and many more things that lead to the unwise. Well, they're using skin bleaching creams in uh, many African countries, even though they have been banned also. All right, so let's continue here. All right, how you all like this type of information? So this is just some, uh, some of the things we deal with in the online course that I teach, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. It's, it, and it's it's part of that 10 course online bundle pack I was telling you about. And you get the six DVDs, uh, the six DVD Black Panther, Black Panther bundle pack as well. You get all that for uh, $80, regularly uh, $180. And that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, so uh, understanding the history of the Morris is extremely important. Uh, to understand how we got to this predicament, we have to understand 1492, January 2nd, 1492, when the Moors lose control of the last stronghold in Spain, which was Grenada. And when you understand the uh, Knights Templar and Freemasonry and how Freemasonry is based upon uh, watered down teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, and then you understand that 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. So then we see the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken. The Greeks call it an obelisque. And there were about 1,200 Tekken new, Tekken new for plural, all throughout ancient Kemet. Today, they're only about 12. They've been taken, uh, they've been destroyed or taken to other countries, Istanbul, Turkey, Paris, France, Vatican City, things like this. Okay, and the Washington Monument, 555 feet, that's a, a ancient African symbol. So very briefly, if we look at Freemasonry, because it's, see all this history, we have to understand this history chronologically. And all this deals with African history. And this deals with where African people went throughout the world. So the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. And Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, uh, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge, okay? The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, okay? Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet or Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, places where light knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So when you study the seven liberal arts, they come out of the mystery schools, they come out of the temples in ancient Kemet. When you look at, uh, when you go to college and you get your degree, you get your credentials in degrees, master's degree, uh, bachelor's degree, PhD, things like this getting your credentials in that series of degrees that comes out of the temples in ancient Kemet. This is where all this stuff comes from. Pages uh, 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Okay, Egypt, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Pages 18 and 32, and then also uh, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. And 13 of the 39 signers of the uh, U.S. Constitution were Freemasons as well. Okay. All right. So we deal with, you know, ancient Kemet. We deal with uh, 
Osiris, Isis, and Horus, or Asar, Aset, and Heru, the first holy trinity as well. This may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. It just means that you haven't gone back far enough in history. Okay, so you have to understand this because from this, this is where you get the uh, the, the famous statue of Aset with the baby Heru. Heru, who the Greeks call Horus, born on December 25th to uh, of, a, of a virgin birth. Okay, and then from uh, Aset and Heru, we get the Black Madonna and, and, and Child, which was worshipped all throughout Europe. They still have statues to this day of the Black Madonna and Child worshipped all throughout Europe. But what happens is with the rise of European powers coming out of the Dark Ages, conquering people's lands, uh, extracting wealth out of people's uh, uh, lands, suppressing people, enslaving them, and then rebuilding Europe, because Europe is coming out of the Dark Ages. They have been devastated. They lost between one quarter to one third of their population, and they're trying to rebuild Europe. As you have an increase in European powers, you have a rise in dominance in the European phenotype. So you start having these these previous African figures reinterpreted as Europeans, whether it's the Black Madonna and Child, whether it's uh, mythological characters like Hercules, whether it's uh, Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel and using his family as the models for Adam and Eve and, and for God and things like this and depicting them as Europeans. And when you have a rise in the European powers, they're pushing the European phenotype as the epitome, as the standard of beauty, as the dominant phenotype. They're pushing European Christianity as the dominant religion, okay, as the standard that everything else needs to be judged by. Okay, so we have to understand how that relates to white supremacy. All right, we deal with why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th, because nowhere in the biblical text does it state that Christmas was celebrated on the no, nowhere in the biblical text does it state that. Uh, Jesus the Christ was born on December 25th. This may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, or disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean that it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Also, if you look up the word Jesus in the dictionary, it takes you back to the word Yeshua. Why? Because, well, the letter J didn't exist until 1630 AD. So when you study the, when you study the alphabet and you understand the, the history of the letter J, the letter J is derived from the letter I. If you read the uh, historical origin of Christianity by Dr. Um, Walter Williams, who's a friend of mine, I've interviewed him a number of times, chapter nine deals with the whole history of the letter J. The letter J is derived from the letter I. The letter J is an I with a hook on it. So the reason why in Islam, the prophet is referred to as Isa with an I, I-S-S-A, I -S -S I think is how they spell it which is Jesus. The reason why the name is Isa in the Quran is because when the Quran was written, the letter J didn't exist. And if you go to um, the Latin, it was uh, Iesus, I-E-S-U-S, I think is how they spell it, Iesus in Latin. Letter J didn't exist. So we're dealing with, we're dealing with the anglicized version of the name. And you call him Jesus. Ask, ask your pastor about that on Sunday. All right. So uh, now here is uh, Dr. Linda Jeffries, uh, one of my teachers, Dr. Linda Jeffries. So when Dr. Jeffries and Professor James Small, another one of my teachers, when they teach, they deal with the pyramid principle, right? So a pyramid has three sides. Here is the pyramid of Khafre at Giza. And uh, one of the three great pyramids of uh, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkere. The foundation is African history and culture. This gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us our cultural paradigm that we see reality through. Uh, and this influences um, our the two sides of the pyramid, our economic empowerment and our political empowerment. Okay? So it doesn't matter how much money we have. If, this, if that foundation is not in place, and this is tied to our self-esteem, if that foundation is not in place, then we won't be able to control our dollar. So we have a $1.3 trillion economy, but 97% of our dollars are spent with people that don't look like us, largely because that foundation is not in place. So as Bantu Stephen Beekle, one of our great South African freedom fighters said, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. We must take our minds back. 
Here's Dr. J. He said that whoever controls the images controls your self-esteem, self-respect, and self-development. Whoever controls the history controls the vision. Okay, and this deals with, you know, understanding how your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. This is why when I see what's taking place with Black China going to uh, Nigeria to promote white tenacious, I understand manipulation of the media and how it's promoting these images on the continent of Africa. Now, let's be clear, Black China did not start this. Right, but she's using her celebrity as an African American celebrity reality TV star to promote this, continue the promotion of this nonsense to our brothers and sisters on the continent of Africa. All right, so those are just a few of the things that we deal with uh, in the online courses. Uh, let's go back to some more of your comments here. Okay. Um, when you read the Bible, the names in the old text is all Nahum, Sham, Shabazz, then new text, Peter, James, John, obvious changes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Do you have these slides available for us? Uh, not, not available. I mean, you go back and watch this, you can see the slides. Uh, not available for us. These are some of the slides in like the online courses that I teach and some of my DVD lectures, things like that. Tasha said, I love it. Um, Dennis, how you doing, Dennis? Okay. All right. So once again, you can um, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, we also have a recommended reading list of books there. Uh, all of my DVD lectures are there. We have almost 900 audio podcasts of our shows and interviews I've done, broadcasts I've done, things like that. Uh, we have the eight DVD bundle pack, uh, the Africans that were here before Columbus, the Africans that were here before Columbus, which includes a double lecture I did with Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, and a double lecture I did with Professor Kaba Kamene, Booker T. Coleman from the Hidden Colors documentaries, because he's dealing with... Uh, the African presence in early America, uh, in ancient America, in Mexico, in the Mississippi Valley, things like this. And then we have uh, what I was talking about and showing you slides from the online courses that, that I teach. We have uh, the 10 course is the Black Panther 10 course online bundle pack uh, and the six DVD uh, bundle. So you get both of them. You get the 10 online courses and the six DVD bundle. That's on sale eighty dollars right now. It's a hundred and eighty dollar value. Uh, that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com as well. And that ten online course bundle pack includes ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, that's a fourteen hour, seven session online course. Uh, we do a PowerPoint presentation, have video clips, book references, deal with thousands of years of history. All these online courses are all on demand. You can go watch at your own pace, watch around the world. Your children can watch it also. If you want to uh, enroll people in the online courses, you want to buy them as a gift for somebody, something like that, you can do that as well. Um, you can uh, order it yourself and then just email. You can email me, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Let me know that you who you want to buy it for and just go ahead and purchase it. Uh, and I will enroll them in the online course. Customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay. Um, okay, so you like this type of information. All right. And uh, let me know if you need me to uh, post any of these links again. And uh, who wanted to register for the online course uh, courses, let me know. They're all on demand. Watch at your own pace. African-American business owners, you can advertise with the African History Network. Um, we do the African History Network show every Sunday, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we put the show into, we, we do it live, but we put it in the audio podcast form on well, six different podcast platforms. Um, well, six different podcast platforms, uh, iTunes, ACAS, FM Player, .com, CastBox, uh, just name a few. And we take a 30-second to 60-second commercial, 
uh, put it into the audio podcast. Each episode reaches thousands of people across the country, so you can reach potential customers. Okay, we have a special promotion. Um, first month, of, the first month is fifty percent off. Second month is free. Email us at customer service at africanhistorynetwork dot com for more information. We have this promotion uh, running until December seventh. And uh, we can get you up and running uh, today. All right, Dominique said, uh, I need one, uh, one for, yeah. So these make great Kwanzaa gifts as well. Okay, some people still celebrate Christmas. I understand that. Also, we have this presentation of mine. I did December 17, 2016, Ancient Kemet, the Winter Solstice. And Christmas. Ancient Kemet, the Winter Solstice and the History of Christmas. This is a three hour presentation. And, that deals with the pre-Christian origins of Christmas, and it goes back to the Roman festivals of Saturnalia, it deals with, connects it to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, things like this. Some people still celebrate Christmas, but they want to get some type of educational um, gifts. Other people uh, celebrate Kwanzaa, and we have, you know, gifts during Kwanzaa as well. Usually last day, but sometimes people give it earlier in Kwanzaa, Zawati. Uh, the gifts for Kwanzaa, and these are usually educational gifts. All right. PayPal and Cash App. Okay. Yeah, PayPal is e excellent. That's fine. Uh, you can also donate to the African History Network if you like this type of information, you want to support us. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. All right. And somebody was asking PayPal and Cash App. Yeah, when you just go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, it processes processes it through PayPal. You can use your debit card, credit card. If you run into any problems, just email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll get you taken care of. And uh, we can also send you a PayPal invoice as well. Okay. Uh, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. But all this helps us to keep doing the research because this is a lot of work. I'm just, just helped it because I'm the one doing it. I did our radio show last night. Some of you all watched that here on Facebook Live. We're going we're gonna to get that up on YouTube. We'll have that into the audio podcast format uh, on Tuesday. Had a great show uh, Sunday, December 2nd. Uh, next Sunday, this coming Sunday, we'll, we'll have uh, Dr. Maulana Ma Karingo on the show, okay, who's the uh, co-creator of Kwanzaa because it was uh, members of organization us, as well as Dr. Karinga who created Kwanzaa. I've written articles, I have a big article about it. I do presentations dealing with like the origins of Kwanzaa and how Kwanzaa is based upon uh, first fruit harvest festivals, uh, celebrations that come out of ancient Kemet, Nubia, uh, uh, Nigeria, amongst the Yoruba, uh, amongst the Akan and Ghana, things like this, okay? All right. Please post links again, John said. Okay, so we'll post the links again. Uh, one, you can go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and we'll post that here. And keep in mind, with our current promotion, spend $100 or more, get 20% off your entire order, okay? And that should help a lot of people out. Uh, and I got to talk about Economic Empowerment Sundays before we get out of here also. That's extremely, extremely important, okay? Because we got we to gotta stop going to these uh all these malls on black friday giving our money away to white corporations um okay so we have that and then uh the uh 10 online course bundle pack the uh black panther 10 online course and dvd bundle pack okay we'll post that link here as well and all this is at africanhistorynetwork.com right on the home page and if you want to donate to the African History Network, also us paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Somebody's asking for the links again. Paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. You can set up for a recurring donation. If you want to donate 15, 25, 50, 100 dollars, what have you, you can do it, donate once, or you can set up for a recurring donation each month as well. Okay. And our website is AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, we know Kwanzaa's coming up, we know Christmas is coming up. I have a, uh, a really good presentation dealing with the history of Christmas. Uh, email me at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and uh, we'll make it happen. Uh, now, Economic Empowerment Sunday. So I've taught entrepreneurship for seven years. My degree is in business administration with a major in marketing from Wayne State, Wayne State University. 
so I came up with this, and I've been talking about this for about the past three weeks, right? So this is a way to recycle $1 trillion in the African-American community in, in one year. This is a way to do that. This is not far, I don't think it's that far-fetched. Um, so Economic and Promise Sunday should take place the first Sunday of each month in African-American churches across the country. So there are approximately 70,000 African-American churches, right? Approximately 70,000 African-American churches. If half of them, if 35,000 did this, we could recycle $1 trillion within the African-American community in one year or more. So what, 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 what should happen, I think, is that the first Sunday of each month, African-American churches have an African marketplace. They have vendors, African-American businesses, who set up in the cafeteria, set up in a room not being used, things like this, first Sunday of each month. And the congregation can go visit and patronize these businesses, these vendor tables in the church before and after church service, okay? First service, second service, what have you. So you charge the, the uh, now the way I came up with this idea is um, each year I speak at Hartford Memorial Baptist Church for the social justice ministry. So in October, uh, late October, I was uh, uh, there and I was doing two workshops dealing with the distortion of Dr. King's legacy. But a couple of weeks ago, they had a pre-Black Friday bazaar, a, a pre-Black Friday bazaar. It was a, a Saturday and Sunday. And they had vendors come in on Saturday. So the work, so there was no church services going on Saturday. But Sunday, there were church services going on. And here's what happened. So they had people come in for the first service and second service. And they came into the vendor area and they uh, lunch was being served as well. But for the church services in the area where the vendors were, we were in the cafeteria. They showed the pastor's sermon that was taking place in the sanctuary. They showed it in on the big screen. Uh, they had like a projector screen or something like that in the area where the vendors were. Okay. And then after the church service, they came down to patronize the vendors. Now the, now the ministers, the pastors, they need to remind people, hey, we have vendors. We have African-American owned businesses. We have vendors there. So please support the vendors. They need to put this in the, 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 the church bulletins or things like this to let people know. But we do this the first Sunday of each month, okay? We do this the first Sunday of each month. Why? Because in many African-American communities, they have more money the first of the month than they do the end of the month. So we need to capture that money and circulate it around our communities, right? Before we go spend it with the white corporations. Okay, so they charge a vendor fee. And you know, a lot of churches have church bazaars, things like this, but I'm talking about making this something uh, making it something uh, systemic and something routine where we do it the first Sunday of each month. So they charge a vendor fee, maybe $25, $50. If they do $50, 35,000 African-American churches uh, 12 times a year, I think that comes out to about $210 million. $210 million going to the churches. That averages out. So if they, if they do it, if they have an average of 10 vendors each time, right? It's something like six thousand dollars per year per church. Okay. Um, and these churches should take half that money and deposit it in African American owned banks. And this creates uh additional funds for these black banks to loan to African Americans to buy houses, start businesses, expand businesses, etc. But if the Businesses that are there, the vendors that are there, they do an average, and a lot of and a lot of businesses would do a lot more. But they if they do an average of two hundred dollars every Sunday, the first Sunday, that comes out to somewhere around eight hundred million dollars over twelve months. The first Sunday, somewhere around eight hundred million dollars. Eight hundred million plus two hundred ten million. That's one trillion dollars. This is just if 35,000 African-American churches do that. Now, some people say, oh, the black church is not going to do that. Well, they, they meet each Sunday. They're already there. A lot of them have space that's not being utilized. 
So instead of a lot of African Americans, so this this can almost work sort of like a a, a a black business incubator, because instead of a lot of these businesses having to go and get brick and mortar locations, and some of of them will have brick and mortar locations, but a lot of them are going to be home based businesses. But they can go to the churches and be there the first Sunday of each month. They can build up a clientele, gain experience or product line. So when they get ready to have a brick and mortar store, right, they already have an established client clientele. And you're and you're utilizing space that's already there. And the and the other thing is is that you don't have to then try when you when you have the economic empowerment Sundays, right? You don't have to then try to go out and market it to other people to attract customers because you already had a congregation there. The congregation is there. You have people. The businesses are there. You all, you, 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 and you utilize space in the church. You don't have to hire really additional people, okay, to, you know, be at the church, things like that, because they're already there anyway on Sundays. So it's a win-win. And we can circulate a trillion dollars very easily in one year. Okay, so they um, and I think I think it came out to like eight hundred billion dollars. I think it came out to like eight hundred, not eight hundred million. I think it was like eight hundred billion dollars. I think it was when I when I did the calculations. Um, was it eight hundred million? Well, let me see. Let me look at this again. Uh. Because I'm going, I'm going from memory. I think I wrote this. I think I wrote it down. All right, how's everybody doing? So, talk to your pastors about uh, economic empowerment Sundays. I need to look at the calculations again. I think it was. Uh, let me look at this again. I thought I wrote it down. Let me see here. If we do. Uh, we could do 35,000 times, uh, 10, uh, do, uh, 10 businesses, $50. That's 500, 500 times 12 is 6,000. Um, and then, um, you do 6,000. Yeah, that's 210 million. And then I think, okay, I think it was like $800 million. Uh, so it's total of a billion. It's total it's a billion instead of a trillion. Billion, so that's, still, that's, still, that's still good. Okay. So yeah, it's a billion dollars, I think it was. Okay. But that's still good. All right. And those are things that we can do now. And if uh, we get um, um, more churches involved, you can circulate more than that. And then let me see. Let me look at this here. If you do... If we're doing on average 10 vendors um, and they do uh, 10 vendors that they do $200 uh, each month times 12 months, it's 24,000 and then times 35,000 churches, yeah, 800, 840 million. 840 million plus uh, 210. So you're looking at uh, a billion dollars right there. It was a billion, not a trillion, but that's still a lot. Nothing to sneeze at. Okay. <laughs> it, it is nothing to sneeze at. All right. And uh, who could, who, who, who could use a billion dollars right now? Let me know. All right. <laughs> okay. Let's make it happen. So this is something that we need to, um, everybody who is involved in the church knows churches your mother's in the church, your, your, your sister's in the church, your father's a pastor, things like this. These are things that we need to talk to the churches about. Okay? This is serious. All right. Okay, guys, look, I have to get out of here. Be sure to visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Take advantage of these promotions. Uh, sign up for the uh, online courses tonight. Uh, today, they're all on demand. Watch at your own pace. And uh, remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow the people to do to you and get away with is based upon 
what you think about yourself, what you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.